yesterday regarding the uh, presumptive uh, blood tests that were conducted by Detective Riley uh, that he will be testifying to uh, today. So that needs to be addressed prior to his testimony. Thank you. Are you ready to call your witness? I am, Your Honor. Thank you. Bring the jury in, please. Mm -hmm. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we resume today with a state of witness. And this is if I may, Detective Your Honor. Pearson, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Sergeant Jamie Pearson. May I approach the court, Your Honor? May I approach the Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God or upon penalty of perjury? Yes. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Sergeant Jamie Pearson, J A M I E P E A R S T O N. Sergeant, you may be seated. Affiliation? Connecticut State Police, Western District, Major Crime. Thank you. May inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? Good. Uh, you currently work with the state police? Yes. I, I have your current rank, please. Sergeant. How long have you been a sergeant with the Connecticut State Police? Uh, approximately two years. Thank you. Um, could you please describe some of your training and experience with the state police? Yes, I uh, was hired in 2008 at the time I attended the State Police Academy. Um, I have received extensive training throughout the course of the academy, as well as um, outside institutions to include um, interview, uh, crime scene processing, uh, scene mapping, photography, evidence collection, blood pattern analysis, various other things. Are you with a particular division or department within the Connecticut State Police? Yes, Western District Major Crime. And do you specialize in any... Um... I guess a specific part of major crimes. Yes, I'm currently the supervisor of the crime scene van. When you say crime scene van, can you just briefly explain what that is? Yes, each district is assigned a van unit, which is compromised of detectives that is responsible for um, processing crime scenes to include scene documentation, um, photography and such, as well as um, analysis interpretation. And you are currently the sergeant for Western District? Yes. Uh, in 2019, what was your role? I was a detective within the same crime scene van unit. How long have you been working in the van unit total? I began in 2018 as a detective and assumed um, command upon promotion. And which was when? 2021. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to draw your attention specifically back to that May 2019 time frame. Uh, did you have an occasion to respond to 69 Wells Lane in New Canaan? Yes. Do you recall when you responded? I responded on the 27th. Was that the first time that you responded there? It was. Okay, so you did not go on the 24th or 25th? No. Okay. Uh, what was your, or why did you respond there? I was 
was um, tasked with producing a scene map as the continuation of scene processing um, was extended to the 27th. Was anyone from New Canaan Police Department on scene when you arrived? Yes, there was a marked cruiser um, securing the scene. And who else from the Connecticut State Police was on scene with you? Uh, myself, Lieutenant Colonel Davison, uh, Detective Riley, Detective Hazen, Detective McGavin. I believe that was it. And you mentioned a sketch map. Is that what you, uh, could you just explain what that is? Yes, we um, take measurements from the scene to produce a map which would depict um, spaces, whether it's you know, size of a building or the room, the crime scene in question, as well as evidence in its relation to the scene. In this case, uh, what did you mean by scene? I was tasked with mapping the garage of 69 Wells Lane. What's the purpose of a sketch map? We want to memorialize the location of evidence um, as well as other items. It could be furniture or um, things of interest, things of value. And you mentioned a few uh, names of individuals who were with you. Uh, in the course of going through the garage, uh, or what were their assignments? Um, Lieutenant Colonel Davison was called in to assist with the blood pattern analysis. Um, Sergeant McGavin was the scene officer, so he produced a scene report. Uh, Detective Riley was responsible for evidence collection and Detective Hazen took photographs. And you mentioned a blood pattern analysis. What is that? It's when the uh, blood presented is um, analyzed and interpreted. Are you trained in blood pattern analysis? Yes. Is that in any way connected to reconstruction of a crime scene? I am not trained to the same level as others. I have a basic um, understanding and uh, knowledge of blood stain. You did not conduct the blood, blood pattern analysis in this case, did you? I did not. Okay, who did? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Davison. Okay. Now, have you worked with Lieutenant Colonel Davison previously? Yes. Uh, about how often? I began um, on <clears throat> patrol in 2008 with, at the time, Trooper Davison, but I've known him throughout my entire career, and when I joined Major Crime in 2013, he was in the unit, and we worked together throughout that tenure. Now, in the course of creating a sketch map, are there certain steps you take? Yes. Could you just walk through with some of those steps that you... You, yes, you do. Once the items are um, items of evidentiary value, I should say, once they are identified, I um, produce field notes where I am measuring them in um, to the scene and memorializing it in a note pattern. Um, I then take the notes and put it into a uh, report and produce a actual uh, map utilizing um, Easy Street Draw, which is the program. What types of tools do you you use when you create the sketch map? Uh, various things. In this case, I used a laser distance measure as well as a steel uh, measuring tape. I can your honor states eight, I believe, is a full exhibit, no objection? That's correct, no objection. They say it will be admitted as a full exhibit. I may just have one minute to sign in. May I inquire, uh, Your Honor, and of the clerk, if the televisions are on? No. May I just have a moment, Your Honor? Don't have No.
Sergeant Pearson, if you can please take a look at what is conveyed on the screen behind you. And if I may, this is States 8, uh, picture 1, uh, which is actually a PDF. And uh, Your Honor, I will say this is a, in with respect to Sergeant Pearson, I have to alternate between PDFs and photographs, so it might not go as smoothly as I hope. Uh, with respect to what's behind you, Sergeant, if you can just, do you recognize that? Yes. What is it? That is um, the first map of eight, which is an overall of the garage like, located at 69 Wells Lane. Now, you um, talked a little bit about taking measurements and utilizing a ruler and um, a measure, a tape measure, I guess. Is that a yes. way to say it? Thank you. Uh, can you walk us through, perhaps explain how you use those tools to create this map? Yes, in this case, I used a rectangular coordinate method, which is the method where you have two steel tapes on the ground in this instance, and they intersect at a right angle to determine a distance from two known points. In this case, it was the footings of the um, poured cement garage floor. Would you mind, please, Your Honor, may I ask her to go up to the screen point? Thank you. Sergeant Pearson, can you please uh, head on up? When you say the footings, what do you mean? Around the perimeter, there's approximately three and a quarter inches of cement that protrudes to the interior of the sheetrock walls. And do you have a marking next to that? And you have an arrow directing it. This is in the, I guess, the bottom middle of the PDF. Um, and a number on the top says 3.25. What does that mean? That's the um, approximate measurement of that protrusion of cement. Okay. And could you please explain on the, I guess, working your way from left to right, if you could just explain some of the markings. Uh, you have A, B, C. What is that? So these were evidentiary zones that allowed us to segment the garage into a more um, workable space and then I was able to take measurements from each evidentiary zone and elaborate or blow it up into a larger map. With respect to the I guess zone G why is that in the middle or why is that depicted like that? So G contained a vehicle at the time of processing and um, we mapped G with the Range Rover in place as found by detectives. And DEF? Same as A, B, and C. It was in the southernmost garage bay. It was split into three evidentiary zones. On the upper right side, or I'm sorry, not even the right side, but on the right side, there is an arrow that has a number. Uh, I think it's 21, starting with 21. Can you just explain what that is? Yep, so this is the interior dimension from um, wall to wall, which would be east-west in a measurement of 21 feet, one inch. Did you measure from, uh, I guess it would be north-south as well? I did, so from north to south, um, footing to footing, <coughs> the interior measurement was approximately 33 feet and 11 inches. Now you also have writing on the left-hand side, and I'm putting my cursor on it uh, over here. What does this mean? This is, um, Part of our map legend which is generally included in every uh, map that we produce and it includes the case number uh, the date the type of case the location uh, my name and signature as well as uh, the scale north arrow and um, whether or not it's one of the series now you there's a marking right in i guess grid b that states area of convergence what is that Area of convergence um, was determined on scene through measurements of the blood stains um, found relevant to this investigation. It's where a line is drawn through the long axis of each blood stain, and where those lines intersect in a two dimensional plane is what's called the area of convergence. Did you determine the area of convergence in this case? I did not. Uh, who did? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Davidson. Is the area depicted on uh, the map conveyed at the area B, where it says area convergence? Uh, is that documented where that area was determined to be? Yes, approximately. Okay. And up here on G, on the, I guess, uh, top middle, what is that depict, supposedly supposed to uh, depict? 
that was two wooden stairs that um, left the garage floor and entered a entry door into a mudroom of the home. Um, you can have a seat, Sergeant Pearson. Um, did you map any other part of the garage? Or I'm sorry, not the garage, the residence? I did not. On states eight, picture two. Sergeant Pearson, if you can just uh, take a look behind you. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes. What is it? That is the northernmost garage bay of 69 Wells Lane. And I also see an A, B, C. What are those markings? Those correspond with the um, evidentiary zones that we just saw in the map in that left or northernmost bay. Did you conduct this? Uh, by the way, did you put the yellow marking tape down? I did not. Okay, who did? Lieutenant Colonel Davison. Was that done before any uh, seizing of exhibits or documentation of the any exhibits that were found in the garage? On the 27th, yes. And I'm going to draw your attention to right behind you again. Sergeant Pearson, uh, do you recognize what's depicted on the screen? This is uh, states eight, picture three. Yes. What is it? This is a uh, blowout of, ex of evidentiary zone A in that northern garage bay. Would you mind also getting back up and pointing to a few things? I apologize. Thank you. Okay. Um, on the, I guess, right middle, there are these dots with a letter and number, A18, A17, A16. Um, what are those supposed to represent? So items that are listed not as an exhibit. So for example, 18, 17, and 16, as well as 15, 14, 13, and 12, those are um, items that were used <coughs> for blood pattern analysis. Not we're necessarily exhibits unless it states next to it. So with respect to A18, and then there's a parentheses, exhibit number 41, parentheses, close parentheses, uh, what does that mean? That is a uh, piece of evidence, so sees as exhibit 41, but also utilized in the bloodstain pattern analysis. So with respect to any documentation on your map that has a letter and number, uh, it is only the ones, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, that have the exhibit next to it that were seized as exhibits in this case. Yes. And the others were used for um, reconstruction? Analysis, yes. Analysis. And the A corresponds to the evidence tree song. Okay. Um, I may see, I'm going to do states three, photograph four. Uh, do you recognize what's depicted on that photograph? Yes. What is depicted on that photograph? <coughs> this is uh, evidentiary zone A. Okay. Now, when something is seized as an exhibit, is it as, said, as you delineated on your on your map, or is there a corresponding, um, I guess, a sticky or marker tag or placard that is used on that uh, in to document <coughs> on the scene? Yes, so typically if it is an item of evidentiary value, it is either noted by a yellow evidence placard, it could be a sticky scale which has the exhibit number on it, it could be an arrow, um, something that could later be photographed and then mapped in to the scene. Okay. States A, picture five. Sergeant Pearson, can you please explain what's depicted on States 8, Picture 5? This is Evidentiary Zone B, also in the northernmost bay of 69 Wells Lane. And on the left-hand side, there are those numbers, B11, B10, and B9. Is that similar to what you just testified for in A? 
It is. So again, items used for analysis um, within the B evidentiary zone are assigned B and a numeric. If it was used as evidence, we included the exhibit number. Now, there are exhibit numbers here, if you can, that are in, have a box or square, I should say, as opposed to a circle and no letter enumeration. It just says exhibit 43. Do you, do you see where I'm pointing out? Yes. Mike? Can you explain that for me? This is an item that was seized from evidentiary zone B, however, not utilized for blood stain pattern analysis. Okay. And does your map on B also show the area of convergence designated yes. by Mark Davidson? Yes, Thank on you. the right hand side of the map. Page eight, picture six. Um, what does this depict? This would be evidentiary zone B with exhibit 42. And picture seven. Evidentiary zone B with exhibits 42, 43, and various um, sticky scales that I referred to earlier. And on the, you pointed to the bottom right as an example. Is that an example of what you were saying designated as a exhibit or a marking uh, that was used for reconstruction? Here. These may have been, I can't quite see. I can scroll Yes, up. so that's an exhibit. It looks like, I can't tell. It's, it's a big, little blurry because yeah, it's eight or thin. Thin, but. but if I can refer you back to your Garage B map, would those, the stickies that you're pointing to, would they have correspond with the, you're pointing to B3, B4, B5? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to show you dates A, picture A. Briefly, if you can explain, please, what's depicted in that photograph? Yeah, this is evidentiary zone C with um, items for analysis and exhibits of 69 Wall Street. The nine on the bottom down here, I am putting my cursor over it. Do you yes. see that? Yes. Can you explain what that is? That is a nine foot wide garage door, overhead garage door, traditional garage door. And the three on the left hand side? That is a three foot window. And states eight, picture nine. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is it? This is the northernmost garage bay evidentiary zones A, B, and C. And zone the zone marked with C, is that corresponding with your um, map? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you states A, picture 10. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes. What is it? Evidentiary zones D, E, and F in the southernmost garage bay. Did you map those sides as well? I did. Okay, it states eight, picture 10. <clears throat> Do you recognize what's depicted on the screen? Yes. What is it, please? Evidentiary zone D with the relevant um, exhibits C's. States eight, picture 11. <clears throat> Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes. What is it? <coughs> Evidentiary zone D. Now, on picture 11, states 8, I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit. There are these, I guess, white backwards L shaped things. If you can just explain what those are. That is a scale typically used in photography to um, photo evidence and how to standardize um, scale in the photo. States eight, picture 12. Do you recognize this photograph, please? Yes. What is it? Evidentiary zone E. And states eight, picture 13. Could you please explain what's depicted in that photograph? Yes, it's a photo of evidentiary zone E. 
seats eight, picture 14. Same question, Sergeant, if you can. Evidentiary zone F. Okay. Now, did you, in the course of creating these maps, uh, document every single thing that was seen in the photographs, the preceding photographs that I showed you? Uh, no, I documented and measured in items of evidentiary value or items utilized for blood stain pattern analysis. Uh, with respect to uh, some of the markings that are, well, strike that if I can. Uh, states <coughs> eight, picture 15. Um, do you recognize what's depicted here? Evidentiary zone F. Now, with respect to items that are seen in this photograph, <coughs> is every single thing that has either a, a white L-shaped ruler or other marking um, contained in your map states a picture 14. I'm going to put that up again. Is it, if you put the two side by side, it may take me a while and I might break my computer if I attempt to do that, but is everything contained in that photograph contained in your map? No. Okay. Well, why is that? The items, um, if we refer back to the photo, there's items uh, nearest the trash can that have the large L scales. We just um, discussed those appear to be transfer type stains, but not seized as evidence or utilized in blood stain pattern analysis. So with respect to some of those transfer type stains or markings in the garage, did you uh, document those in your uh, sketch map? No. Were those documented otherwise? In photography, yes. State 16. I'm sorry, it's states 8, picture 16. Show you picture 16. Do you recognize what's depicted on the screen? Yes, this is industry zone G. Um, with respect to uh, exhibit 67, is that related to a actual exhibit? It is not. Um, originally, an item was designated as Exhibit 67 and subsequently photographed and mapped in. And it was uh, later learned that it had been relocated and not seized as an exhibit. Therefore, I submitted a, an additional addendum map to correct that. With respect to uh, Exhibit 67, do you know where Exhibit 67, was there actually something that was delineated 67? I should say that. On this map? No. Yes, yeah. so 67 was seized from the northern um, garage door, the interior side of the garage door. And states a picture 17, what does this depict? This is the vehicle that was located in evidentiary zone G with it looks like some several exhibits on the side as well as exhibit 44. And when you conducted your analysis with respect to creating the map, the vehicle was in place? Yes. Okay. Okay, you can have a seat, Sergeant. Thank you. Uh, with respect to any of the evidence that was collected on 69 wells or in the garage, did you have anything to do with the evidence collection process? No. Uh, with respect to the Land Rover, or Range Rover, actually, that you see on the screen behind you, did you have anything that day, or anything to do with the evidence collection process with the Range Rover? No. Okay. Uh, with respect to a Chevy Suburban, uh, are you aware there's Chevy Sh Suburban related to this case? Yes. Were you involved in the processing of that item? Yes. Okay. Uh, what day were you involved in that? We traveled to New Canaan Police Department that following day, so the 28th. And what was your assignment with respect to the Chevy Suburban? I took the inventory of the Suburban. Uh, by inventory, what do you mean? We document the vehicle um, as found by Western District Major Crime Detectives, and we inventory the items seized as well as the condition of the vehicle and 
some like mileage, um, damage, things like that. Would that also include any uh, blood spatter or anything that is, um, uh, I guess, evidence processing? Is it, I don't know if that's the correct way to say it, but would it include it, if you can understand the question? So that day we did process the vehicle fully, but the inventory does not contain evidence okay. in that report. Uh, what is the purpose of doing an inventory report? We want to document everything that was found in the vehicle so far as like uh, personal belongings or I mentioned damage, um, mileage, things like that. In the course of conducting the inventory search of the 2017 Chevy Suburban, did you determine if there were any WeatherTech liners in the vehicle? Yes. Uh, what do you mean by WeatherTech liners, or what are we talking about? So we're on the same page for what a WeatherTech liner is. Yes, it's a uh, custom forms, but it's a hard rubber mat that protects the vehicle floorboards, interior vehicle floorboards. And were those custom mats inside the vehicle? Yes. Where? The front left and front right had individual ones, and then there was a very large um, mat that spread from the second row passenger to the third row rear passenger, one large mat. Was there a WeatherTech liner in the trunk of that vehicle? No. Nothing further, thank you. You cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Sergeant Pearson. Good morning. I think we've spoken before. Yes. Um, I just have a few questions about um, what you did at the residence in New Canaan. Um, when you placed, there are a couple of pictures I just want to ask you about. And if um, I would ask that if we could put up just for a minute um, exhibit 10A. And if you just look back there for a second. We don't have a 10. It's number, it's the exhibit eight, but it's, uh, t yeah, 10, this is uh, 10A from exhibit eight that you were just showing a little bit. Uh, and I'm just going to ask you if you would please explain. Um, there is a, um, there, the yellow tape that's uh, placed on the measuring tape. Is that in inches or in uh, centimeters? I believe it's just inches. I'm not I don't recall if the, set, the other side has metric measurements. I'd have to look at it closely. Right. And, and you're aware of the fact that if it's, if it's uh, metric, there are approximately 2.54 centimeters to one inch, correct? Yes. OK. <laughs> You'll take my word for it. I will. All right. Um, can I zoom in a little bit, please, on the yellow uh, tape measure, please? And of course, it's a little bit blurry, but um, can you, you can't tell from here whether it's inches or centimeters. Is that right? It appears to just be inches. Okay. And then there's the little, if we could zoom out again, please. Now, you also made reference to some of these white tapes. And again, I'm just going to... Um, I'm referring to, we're talking about these little white dot, uh, items such as what, what's on the blown up image now. Now we can't read this in the blow up, can we? I cannot. So let me go to, um, let's go to exhibit 11 and see if we can see it any better, please. And for the record, this is garage D. This is the section of the garage uh, that you called um, I think D, correct? Yes. The portion? All right. And if we can look at, there are a bunch of these little white tapes down there. If we could just slightly um, zoom in on the white L-shaped portion. Let's do the larger one there. OK. 
Can, now, there are little numbers that do appear on this uh, photograph. Isn't that correct? Yes. Can you tell whether those are in um, inches or in centimeters or some or millimeters for that matter? I'm familiar with the largest of the two scales, and that is metric. Um, the smaller may have. Uh, it looks like it's all metric. Okay. And do you recall whether the, the numbers are, the number you see marks centimeters or millimeters? I'm assuming centimeters, but I'm going to ask you. Yes, centimeters. The smaller would be millimeters. All right. Now, if you look at the bottom right of the, this blow up there where you see the yellow tape down at the bottom there, and again, I'm just going to, for the record, these appear to be centimeters as well, do they not? I believe they're inches. Okay, fair enough. But if you compare the yellow to the white, we'll see that the measurements in yellow are, of course, where each number is larger than the number of spaces with the lines up at the white part. Is that correct? Yes. So just for the benefit of, of me, so if we're looking at the red mark that I'm now circling here, that's between the, the L shape of the, of the white uh, uh, centimeter markings. Could you just describe, based on those measurements, the approximate size, and again, uh, I'm not going to ask you to get up there and measure it, but how approximately sized do you see this red mark there? Approximately how long that is and how wide? I'm merely guessing, but a couple inches, possibly. Okay. Right. And if you would now please go to uh, number 17 on exhibit 8, please. And you indicated that you marked the uh, certain something on the ground there under the tire that you put placed that yellow marker on that in that uh, photograph, correct? No, I did not. Can you just tell us who placed the markers? I would guess the evidence officer did that. Right. So when you say you guess, you weren't there when that was done. Right? I did not see that, no. Right. So you didn't um, have a say in which places markers would be placed, no. right? So you come in there on this occasion, at least at the garage, to document what someone has already done with regard to the yellow placards. Yes. What about the white we have a couple of those same white markers on the side of the uh, Range Rover, correct? Yes. Did you place those? I did not. So as I understand it, uh, what about the yellow measuring tape in inches that's uh, marking off the quadrants? I did not place those. All right. So someone else, do you know who did that, by the way? The yellow tapes would have likely been Lieutenant Colonel Davison. Um, the evidentiary items with the white scales or yellow placards, likely the evidence officer, um, okay. Detective but, Riley. But, but again, you weren't there for that, so you don't know. I was there. I didn't do it, though. But you don't recall seeing who did it? it it's four and a half years ago. No, I do not recall. All right. Um, but <coughs> was, did anyone direct you on what to take pictures of on that occasion? I didn't take any photographs. No, I'm including the ones we're looking at right now. You took that one, didn't you? I did not. I didn't take any photographs at 69 Wells. I simply mapped the garage. I misunderstood. You yeah. only did the measurement. Correct. And you used the measurements for your map design, which we saw, correct? Yes. So, and, and so I'm clear, of all the photographs that you were shown and you were asked to describe, you took none of those. I did not. You, the, the measurement maps that we have you documented what was already in photographs that someone else did. Is that right? Yes. And then you added it to your various maps that we saw, right? I did not. The state did. It's not in my report. I simply included the maps and my narrative in my report. So when you say the state did, I'm not sure I understand. What, what do you mean by that? I think it was prepared for court that way. Oh, but you did you not prepare the, the actual uh, PDF maps that we just saw? Yes, just not the photographs. Oh, I see. Yeah. You, you didn't have photographs interconnected with those, with your maps. Correct. You just did maps. Yes. I have no further questions. Thank you. Was there a redirect? No, sir. Thank you. Or did you make that, sir? Thank you.
Mr. Renner, if I may have a um, brief five minute break just to set up the computer with respect to Detective Riley. He is my only other witness for today, but there is uh, some documentation the state wishes to show him. Ladies Receive and gentlemen, uh, this is just a matter of setting up for the next witness. We would ask that you return to the deliberation room. Please do not discuss the case. <laughs> The court's order is that there be no photos taken for which we can hear a click. That is not permitted. So if you can muffle the click, that would be in compliance with the order. Do we have to take up the argument on the uh, motion to preclude presumptive blood testing at this point. Yes, Your Honor. Can I just have a moment to... Uh... It's my understanding that through this witness, the state is going to try to introduce at least three, perhaps four, because I went through this uh, last night, photographs of the glow of, uh, of either Luminol or Castle Meyer, which is shortened in some documents to KM, which is the uh, reagent test, the presumptive test for blood. I had cited in my motion State versus Moody. I also cited the um, New Jersey appellate court case of uh, State versus Pittman and uh, the Arkansas case of Young versus State, which were subsequent to Moody, that all stand for the proposition that um, the presumptive test for blood, whether they use luminol or they use the Castle Meyer. Um, uh, product is a, some kind of an aerosol spray that reacts to different substances. One of the substances is blood. Other is, there's other um, fluids that do, but also certain kinds of, of cleansers do, certain rust products do. There, there may be a, I, I saw one article that listed 30 things that react to it. Now, I'm not sure other than what the state mentioned yesterday, the idea that it should come in just so that the uh, state can explain why certain pictures were taken. We're about to see, I didn't count them all, but about 40 photographs that cover all of these same areas. We've already seen pictures of drops of blood, alleged blood, um, or blood-like stains from both the... Uh, uh, suburban and from the garage. There's, we also had the video that showed the, and there were zoom ins of the same thing as well as the body camera showing something that was a blood like stain. Now, State versus Moody addresses two issues, and the case that was mentioned yesterday, the uh, Grant case, and there are a couple of other appellate court cases. There were two issues in Moody, and I want to make this clear because the state is kind of conflated the two issues. The first issue in Moody was whether or not um, a lay witness or anyone else, a police officer, could imply that something was looked like blood and whether a lay opinion was appropriate in the absence of confirmatory testing. Both in, in Moody, there's another case called Whipple, um, State versus Whipple, where they discuss that. And then in Grant, they explain the difference between the findings in Moody and Whipple and in the Grant case, 
where it wasn't about luminol. It wasn't about this presumptive blood testing. It was instead about whether a lay witness can say, it looked like there was a pool of blood, the person was bloody, et cetera. And that was the issue in those later cases. I think I emphasized yesterday, and I want to have to re-quote it, but the Supreme Court specifically, the Supreme Court of Connecticut has specifically said that there is absolutely no probative value, no probative value whatsoever in the presumptive testing. And therefore, the fact that they took some additional photographs, which we're going to have every inch of these vehicles being photographed anyway, because there's a presumptive test that glowed, is going to confuse the jury. And I'm going to explain, it's not just going to be about here. Later on, when they do the presumptive test of the glow, the luminol in the Tacoma, it wasn't blood at all. It's not human. It's not organic. So it's the only possible reaction of this jury is they're going to be thinking that somehow, aha, the fact that this turned, it glowed in the blue light, there must be more blood there. There's hard, as the court is well aware, there is not very much blood at all on either scene, either on the Suburban, which now the court has seen, or in the garage. So the danger here is the prejudice is the jury's going to think, oh, well, there's more because this spray makes it look like there was even more that we're not picking up. But in both cases, as far as I know, when they tested it, it was, when they went to the lab, it was not blood. But when we get back to the issue at hand, since it has no probative value under Moody, and the issue has to do with whether or not it's going to either be confusing or in some way prejudicial, if they're going to try and introduce it, then I insist that we have a quarter hearing. Because if the court, I thought it's already been decided that it has no value, and a lab person down the road may testify to that, but in light of your ruling from yesterday, if the state doesn't ask a subject matter, I don't get to cross-examine about it, and only if I decide to put on a case, in the defense case, would it even come out. And so, you know, in following the court's rulings, and the way the court wishes to proceed, we're talking about three or four pictures today through Detective Riley, or I don't know if he's now a sergeant, but he was a detective at the time, and asking in the question why he took certain pictures, which I submit is irrelevant since they took pictures of everything and documented everything. So in light of the decision in Moody and in the case of State v. Whipple, where there's such a strong view by the Connecticut Supreme Court that has no probative value, and they use the word whatsoever, that it will only lead to prejudice. And I submit that the argument that, well, they can distinguish Moody, not on this issue. There is not a single case that I could find anywhere that said that it had probative value at all. That is, we're talking about this reagent spray test. It had any probative value whatsoever, but there's a lot of not only danger or prejudice, but confusion. What's the jury going to think? What's the court going to instruct the jury? That it has no value and we're only putting it in because that's where the officer wanted to take pictures? There's like 40 pictures we're about to see from Detective Riley. The whole car, the three pictures where they used the blue light to do that, or the black light, rather, and it looks blue in the photographs. There's no explanation for it. There's no legitimate basis for it. So on those basis, I ask the court to preclude, again, we're talking about three or maybe four pictures out of 40 which are going in. I could also argue cumulative, but we don't even get to that in light of the fact that there's just such danger with this particular misunderstanding and misapprehension for what's essentially junk science. There are a lot of things they could, I'll give you one last example and I'll see. There could be a situation where a police officer conducts a polygraph test and said, yes, polygraphs are not admissible, but based on what was said, I then went and did X. But of course, the Supreme Court has said you can't bring in polygraph for any reason because it's not reliable and has no probative value. 
So to use that as the, the reason for conduct by a police officer in this case would certainly be more prejudicial than probative. And it's also not necessary for the state's case to prove their case. I just have one minute. I've also been reminded that in Moody, the court talked about how that particular piece of evidence had an impact on the jury. And that's why the Supreme Court was so adamant that it's not admissible because it has no validity in either science or in the law. Thank you. So first, Attorney Schoenhorn, the court wants to understand what the nature of the testimony may be from this next witness. So this next witness took photographs, is that correct? No. No, that is not correct, Your Honor. If I may interject, the next witness didn't take any photographs. The next witness is the evidence officer who determined which items in the garage to seize as exhibits and or document as evidence. He authored an evidence report or exhibit report, which indicates every item that is documented on Sergeant Pearson's map. He is the individual who made that decision in connection with Lieutenant Colonel Davidson to examine those items. He also, if you look at the exhibit report, did KM testing on around 30 of those exhibits, Your Honor. Some of which, about four of them came back negative. He documented that as well. There are about three or four photographs the state intends to introduce as well with respect to the luminol that was done on the car that counsel is referring to. But it's not by itself what this detective is testifying to. He's testifying to the content of the photographs, not taking them. So just to be very clear on that. Well, what is his testimony expected to be? His testimony is going to walk through the garage, identify the items that were seized as exhibits in 69 Wells itself in the house. So let the court interject here. His testimony is going to be what items were seized that were of evidentiary value, correct? And what he did when he processed the scene, yes. Let's just talk about what he decided to seize. Yes, Your Honor. So his testimony is going to be he decided to seize what? With respect to the presumptive test. Yes, Your Honor. He worked in connection with Lieutenant Colonel Davidson with respect to the blood pattern analysis that was done. He seized various swabbings of various blood spatter that was found, including some of the exhibits. He tested them for using the KM test. He then swabbed them, the process of swabbing them and logging them as exhibits in this case. So again, the court has to ask this question. What he did was swab those areas of that vehicle or garage floor, correct? He swabbed those areas and he performed the KM test. And then they were subsequently sent to the lab. He is part of that chain in command. That is the nature of the testimony presented, Your Honor, with respect to the presumptive test. So he is going to be asked, the court assumed, that he did not take the photographs, correct? Because Attorney Pearson did not take the photographs. She did not. The state did not offer them as a photographer. I offered them as a representation of what the map was. Well, the only way, counsel, that the jury knows what was or what the garage floor looked like was through photographs. Yes. The only way that your next witness can testify about what he swabbed is because we saw the photographs. Those and there are more photographs that the state intends to introduce. He will testify to each one if necessary. If counsel is objecting to those photographs coming in, then I will lay a foundation for each and every one utilizing the screen and asking him if that is a fair and accurate representation of what he observed that day and 
what he sees as evidence. I have no problem doing that, Your Honor. I did not do that, by the way, with um, Sergeant Pearson, just for the court, because counsel did not have any objection to the photographs coming in to save time. But I will, if that is what is needed. Well, the testimony is going to have to reach the point where he says he swabbed this area because. Yes. And that's where this issue arises, correct? If, if I may just clarify and uh, actually bounce off what counsel said, the what we discussed yesterday, and I believe your court, the court order ruled an issue on is uh, the fact that the police officer can testify or even lay witness can testify that something appears to be blood-like. That would be the start of the testimony. Then I believe uh, Detective Riley will testify as to once he determined that it was blood light, what his next steps were, either to swab it or test it for a K, utilizing the KM test. So it's a link in the chain after. So just to keep those two issues separate. Well, just to phrase it colloquially, he's going to testify it looked like blood to me. Yes. Next. He's going to indicate that it was swabbed because it looked like blood to him. Yes. And also he performed a presumptive test, correct? Yes, but just to qualify that, Your Honor, I don't believe that the only reason it was further swabbed and further steps were taken was simply because of the look of the, of the item. It was the entire concept or the facts of the case including the fact that he, uh, we have Jennifer Dulos is a missing mother of five who dropped her kids off from school and never returned home, including the fact that it all happened in her home. The blood uh, was uh, positioned in one location and made it more likely that it was blood. There were numerous factors going into his decision. So it, it is a little more nuanced than that. Well, counsel has indicated that there are a number of grounds on which he believes that a lay witness should not testify concerning the presumptive test. Now, what counsel laid out in the court is just indicating what it understands from the argument. First, it may confuse the jury. Second, if that it was prejudicial, well, the issue is not whether it's prejudicial, it's whether it's unfairly prejudicial. So what the court is going to do is review State versus Moody and any related cases. And we have to take a recess for that. And if I may, Your Honor, I would ask the court to review State v. Grant, which is 286 Con 499. 286 Con 499. Yes, sir. It's a 2008 case as well as State v. Downing. State which v. Downing? Downing, D-O-W-N-I-N-G, 68, Con App 388, 2002. Your citation again, please. 68, Con App 388, 2002 case. And of course, the state would always refer, yesterday I referred to State v. Schaefer, which is that 1975, 168, Con 309. Uh, so I would ask the court to review those. And then after, at some point, the state would like to be heard on the motion, on the legal analysis side of it. I would just ask the court um, for that time when the court is ready. One other um, matter that we don't have to talk about this second, but um, what I just heard uh, Attorney Manning say is that they're also going to suggest that uh, the reason certain pictures were taken is because of all this hearsay that he heard. So they're going to do a narrative about what the, they think their theory is, which again is not necessary. This is the evidence technician who gathered evidence. I was also under the impression, based on what was said, that they took photographs at the same time. But if they didn't, I'm not going to object to the other photographs coming in through this witness. They obviously, whoever took them, and there are multiple detectives who took photographs at various point, points, I'm not going to require the author 
of those photographs, because any witness can say, is this fair and accurately represent what it looked like when you're in there? So I'm indicating that for the record. However, asking to explain why he took certain photographs so he can get into multiple narratives about the hearsay about the case, when all he needs to say is, I went in there, I had information, and I took photographs. What he heard about the case is not relevant to his actions. And it would also involve the confrontation, the right, my right to confront and cross-examine about whatever he was told, whether it was accurate or inaccurate, where this witness won't be able to say. And I just think it'll take us on a little detour, unnecessary detour, through allegations that were being made in the media and from other individuals. So I just note that. That may be part of what's going to be heard. I just don't know. Can I just clarify again, this witness did not take the photographs. Counsel keeps reiterating about why photographs were taken. It's not the state's intention to offer testimony that Detective Riley ordered those photographs taken because the photographer meant to take that specific photograph. It's the actual exhibit sees. Fair enough. I will amend my remarks. The fact that he took certain swabs does not depend upon the nature of the investigation in terms of what he had heard about what had happened in the days before he got there. He was assigned to take certain, it looks the way it looked, he took certain swabs, and then it went to the lab. I have no objection to any of that. It's this prejudicial notion that we have to get into either hearsay or worse, junk science as a basis, which the Supreme Court has said easily confuses the jury, especially since we won't be hearing from the lab until at least a week from now, as far as I know. If I can, Your Honor, just clarify a few things here. And again, I would like to be heard on the law. So prior, at some point I would, so before we get back into cases, but just for, just to make sure that it is, the record is very clear that the detective with his training experience is going to testify, and this is the offer of proof, about why he took a swab. It's not just because of the color. Otherwise, we'd be taking ketchup stains everywhere. It is because of his training and experience and his interpretation as the evidence officer. He has a right to that testimony. With respect to the law, I will reserve my argument for when Your Honor deems fit. Thank you. Well, it is clear that the evidence officer was summoned to 69 Wells Lane because there was a missing persons report. So one could claim, well, that's hearsay. I'm not objecting to that, Your Honor. Just for you. Thank you. This is going to take some time for the court to review these cases. So of course, the court would allow the jury to go into a recess at this point anyway. We're probably not going to come back until 1215. Stand in the recess until 1215. All rise. This honor will be recorded and I'll stand in the recess until 1215. Stand up.
it's helpful to first determine uh, who testified about what they believed to be blood. Here, they were recipient witnesses. Several witnesses that had uh, been on scene and observed certain substances and stains at the crime scene. The testimony by those witnesses was to be that what they observed was blood. Now, the defendant moved for an in limine preclusion of that testimony by any lay witness or recipient witness, on scene witness, unless there was sufficient evidence to establish that that item or those items had been tested and found to be blood. So in Grant, uh, the state, or rather the <coughs> court, cited State versus Schaefer, finding that uh, it was permissible to admit into evidence the opinions and common observers, or rather of common observers in regard to common appearances, facts, and conditions. However, that testimony could not have been based on the testimony of others or some hypothetical set of facts. So the holding, as the court sees the holding in that case, is that even lay witnesses can testify as to their belief that a substance was blood as long as that testimony is not based on what the court described as testimony of others or hypothetical statements of facts. Now, of course, in Moody, uh, that was a situation in which expert testimony was offered. The expert witness said, uh, said that a stain found on one of the defendant's shoes had given a positive result on a presumptive test for blood. In Moody, there was a presumptive test only. The court held that the result of the presumptive test for blood had no probative value whatsoever. The test result did nothing toward establishing the likelihood of the presence of human blood. In that case, there was only the presumptive test. That testimony should have been excluded and should have been found inadmissible. Now, in State versus Whipper, there was no testing at all by the police detectives. The detectives had testified that an eyewitness had seen the defendant break a vase over the victim's head. The police concluded in their testimony that the bloody hand or palm print on that vase was actually blood. An expert then testified at the same trial, and he stated that the uh, b uh, bloody palm print on the vase was the defendant's, but he said on cross-examination that the substance on the vase had reacted to certain chemical reagents consistently with the way blood would react, but there were other substances that would have the same reaction. Well, because the police did not test the blood, the fingerprint expert did not test for blood. The court concluded that uh, it was improper for the state's witnesses to testify that the palm print found on the vase had been made in blood. In Grant, that was again a recipient witness testimony. They observed what they believed to be blood and described as a trail of blood. This is another case in which you have lay people testifying about what they believe to be the substance. The court held there a person of ordinary knowledge and experience is generally competent to testify that a substance personally observed by that person appeared to be blood. 
although the particular facts and circumstances surrounding the witness's observation of the substance might affect the weight to be given to the testimony, the fact that the substance was not subject to scientific testing to rule out any possibility that it was not blood does not render the testimony inadmissible. So now we come to Downing. In Downing, we have a criminologist testify, opining on the stand that they relied on a presumptive test for blood. The defendant argued that that testimony should have been precluded pursuant to Moody. In Downing, the court, well, the court should say this first. This issue really comes down to what is probative. And to make it simple, is a presumptive test by itself probative? What did Moody know? It is not probative. On that basis, it would not be admitted. The next question is, is a presumptive test under all circumstances not probative? The answer to that is no. In Downing, the court quotes Moody, the presumptive test for blood had no probative value whatsoever because the test did nothing toward establishing the likelihood of the presence of human blood. We're talking there about a situation in which there was no other factor to be considered. However, in Downing, the court indicated that the presumptive test, again, by itself, is not going to be probative in any degree. However, there are other factors that can be considered that would render it probative, not conclusive, but probative, such as the color of the substance, the shape of the substance, other factors that could indicate that the presumptive test could be confirmed. Now, in this case, we have a presumptive test or presumptive tests. The issue then becomes, are there other factors that can render the presumptive test not conclusive, but probative? Because relevant evidence has this definition. It's evidence that has any tendency to make a fact, the existence of a fact that is material to the determination of the matter more probable or less probable than it would be without the evidence. So in this case, you have a presumptive test by itself, not good enough. But you also have a missing person investigation. You have the color and shape of unidentified stains. You have spatter pattern. You have unidentified stains on the vehicle, in the garage, and you have an abandoned vehicle owned by Jennifer Dulos. In combination, the presumptive test is probative. The issue now goes to what weight the jury will give to the evidence. So the only danger the state can run into is if there's a question asked and the defense, rather the state's witness says, that presumptive test is conclusive. And remember, the court can also ask questions. So the court is going to allow the testimony concerning the presumptive test. But again, the court has informed the jury that this court will ask questions. Just for the record, I would note that in Downing, the expert evidence showed that some of the splatter had already been tested and confirmed at the lab to be blood, not just that it looked like blood. And that's why it was allowed. But the court, I would ask the court to address the second part of my argument, that its probative value 
is, is completely outweighed by its prejudice, especially in light of the fact there is no confirmatory test and that when it is tested, it is not blood. So to let it in is the equivalent of allowing, um, as I indicated, that rust that the jury can infer that uh, that was blood. So I ask the court to at least address the other part of my argument. Well, the, the, the issue again is not prejudice, but unfair prejudice. Yes. The state wish to be heard. Your Honor, with respect to the, the uh, fact that a test is, a, all evidence is going to be prejudicial, the, to rise to the level of unfair prejudice, prejudice, prejudice at this point, I don't think evidence of a, of a presumptive test when the witness is going to testify that it is um, you know, presumptive in its very nature. He's also subject to a very competent counsel who can cross-examine him about the adequacy of that test and about the fact that a lot of this evidence did make it along the change in chain and go to the lab and what they did there, whether they tested it or not. I'm not going to even address any of that today. I believe Attorney McGinnis will deal with that next week. But with respect to the prejudicial value, I don't think it rises to unfair prejudice. And counsel can cross-examine, and that will go before the jury. Well, again, the only danger the court sees for the state is that the state's own witness says it's conclusive. I understand that, Your Honor. As far as unfair prejudice is concerned, the court does not see that the prejudice is so substantial as to preclude any effective cross-examination. So the court will allow testimony concerning the presumptive test. We can bring the jury in. <clears throat> to stipulate to the presence of all of the jurors? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, may I call my next witness? Yes. The state calls Detective Riley, Matthew Riley, to the stand. May I approach the clerk? Yes. That's fine, Your Honor. Uh, okay, Madam Clerk. The witness. If you could please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm, as the case may be, that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I help you God or upon penalty of perjury? I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. It's Matthew Riley, R E I L L Y. And you may be seated. Thank you. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Fine, ma'am. Mr. Riley, or Detective Riley, I'm sorry, are you currently employed by the state police? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I retired from the Connecticut State Police in January of 22. Okay. If you could uh, please explain, did you, what rank did you retire? At? I retired as a uh, sergeant. And in 2019, what rank did you have? I was a detective. Could you briefly just explain a little bit about your training and experience as a, as a sergeant with the Connecticut State Police? Yes, I've, uh, I've been a detective for approximately uh, 20 years of my 23 year career. And during that time, I've had classes in uh, intermediate crime scene processing, advanced crime scene processing, late print development, blood stain pattern analysis, uh, death investigation, homicide investigation, and probably a myriad of other classes. And with respect to the Connecticut State Police, uh, were you assigned to a particular troop or division? I was assigned to the Western District Major Crime Squad, where I, uh, I worked on the van unit as a uh, crime scene investigator. Could you please explain what a crime scene investigator is? So a uh, crime scene investigator is tasked with the investigation of a crime scene, processing evidence, uh, handling evidence, packaging evidence, and uh, coordinating with uh, laboratory analysis and such things as that. Could you discuss a little bit about your training, if you have any, with respect to crime scene analysis, that particular part of being, or that assignment, I should say? Yes, uh, I've, uh, I've attended uh, intermediate uh, crime scene processing courses, advanced crime scene processing courses, uh, law enforcement photography, blood stain pattern analysis, uh, different uh, trainings on the investigation of not only homicide scenes, but scenes of sexual assault, and uh, uh, classes on medical legal death investigation. And how long were you assigned to the van? Uh, approximately 14 years. In 2019, who was assigned to the van with you? So the van unit in 2019 uh, was supervised by Sergeant Do Joe Duva, and then there was myself, Detective Jamie Pearson, uh, Detective Jeremy Combs, Detective Frank McGavin, and uh, Detective Mike Downs. I'm going to draw your attention specifically now to May 24th, 2019. Did you report to uh, 69 Wells Lane that day in New Canaan? I did. Why did you respond there? Uh, I was, uh, I received a telephone call from the uh, Western District Commander saying that the New Canaan Police Department was requesting assistance with a uh, missing person investigation where they suspected foul play. And what was your assignment for going to, or what was your reason for going to 69 Wells? Uh, they were specifically, uh, what I understood at the time, they were just uh, asking for crime van assistance or crime scene investigation assistance. So um, I responded to uh, Western District Headquarters in Litchfield, uh, grabbed the truck, and drove down to uh, 69 Wells in New Canaan. So the truck, what is on the truck, if you can describe it a little bit? So it's uh, the major crime van is a... Uh, it's kind of a big toolbox on wheels. So it's a, it's a small body uh, or kind of a medium uh, duty truck with a cargo body on the back that contains uh, all of our equipment, all of our uh, supplies, additional lighting, uh, cameras, such things as that. About what time did you respond there? Or to 69 Wells, I should say. I probably arrived sometime around 2 o'clock in the morning on the 25th. Was anybody on scene when you arrived? Um, well, I know uh, New Canaan Police Department had uniform officers there. And then I really don't remember who, who arrived first from our, from our crew. Now, you mentioned a 
couple names about people who worked on the van. Did anybody that you named arrive or come to 69 Wells that day? Yes, Detective Frank McGavin was available, so he responded. And then we had several what we call alternates. So detectives who also work in Western District Major Crime, they have additional crime scene training and experience, and they come to kind of backfill absences for people who are not able to respond. And who were those alternates? The alternates that day were Detective Corey Clavey, Detective Bob Hazen, Detective Katie Keppel, and Detective Dwayne Lopierre. Did you enter the house on it? Well, I'm going to, if I can, check that. Is there a, when you conduct a search of a residence, is there a certain process or procedure that you utilize? Yes. So when we arrive at a scene, usually in serious cases, the local PD is obtaining, in the process of obtaining a search warrant by the time we arrive on scene. We get a briefing as to the investigation up to that point, usually from the lead detective. You know, I'm going to object. This is not a, the question is not what he did then. He's talking about in general. I don't know if that's helpful. Well, the question is what the, what was the procedure on that date, correct? Yes, Your Honor. If I would request that. The response was generally this is what we do. That's non-responsive. So the objection is. I'll rephrase. I will rephrase. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, with respect to May 24th, 2009, actually it would be May 25th, 2019. Did you have a specific procedure in place with the other officers on the van in conducting a search of 69 Wells? Yes. So like I said, I arrived at approximately 2 o'clock in the morning. Again, New Canaan was obtaining a search warrant for the property. And as, once everybody arrived, we divvied up our various assignments of what we were going to do that night. What were those assignments? So Frank McGavin, he was assigned to take notes at the scene and prepare a scene report. Basically, it's observations and actions at the scene. I took evidence collection, so I was the evidence officer. It was my responsibility to identify, collect, package, and label all the evidence. We had a primary photographer. We also run a backup photographer. We have a videographer. And then we had somebody prepare a sketch map. Who was your primary photographer? That would be Detective Katie Keppel. And the backup photographer? Detective Bob Hazen. And is there a particular order that those assignments are done in the course of May 25th, 2019 processing? That night, we started out with video recording, overall video recording of the scene. Then we'll start primary and backup photography overall. I'm sorry, let me back up. The first thing we do is we conduct a walkthrough. So we conduct a walkthrough, kind of see what we have, identify any kind of fragile or transient evidence that we have. Again, I'm going to object. It sounds like he's not talking about what he did, but what he usually does. The objection essentially is non-responsive. The question is not what normally the routine is. It is what happened that day sustained. Detective Riley, did you participate in the walkthrough of 69 Wells? Yes, I did. How did you enter the house? I entered through the garage. And then I went ahead and accessed the front door because the garage appeared to have a great deal of evidence in it. We didn't want to get it trampled. So I opened the front door, let Detective McGavin and Detective Keppel in. We conducted a quick walkthrough. And if I can, what is the purpose of that walkthrough? 
we were looking for kind of the, the layout of the house, the situation, getting a feel for what we had. Uh, we were looking for any kind of uh, transit evidence, fragile evidence, and we would uh, start to develop a plan on how we would uh, basically tackle this problem. And after the walkthrough, what was the next step in processing the scene? Uh, the next step in processing the scene is uh, Corey Clavy started his video recording. Were you a part of that? No, I was not. And after the video recording? After that, um, the photographers went through, primary and backup. Were you a part of the primary or backup photography? No. While the videography or the primary and backup photographers are in the house, what were you doing? Uh, while they were in the house, I was uh, swabbing the points of entry door handles for uh, latent DNA. Uh, I just want to clarify and ask you about the word swabbing. What exactly do you mean by swabbing? A swab is just a, a long-handled uh, Q-tip. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's contained in sterile packaging, and we use it for the collection of evidence. Where do you get the swabs from? Uh, forensic Supply House. And how are they preserved, or are they preserved, I should ask you? Uh, the swabs are contained in... Uh, they're individually packaged in sterile, um, sterile wrappers. When we use them, um, you know, we collect, we collect evidence and then we place them inside of a, uh, a short box that we seal and put inside of a larger envelope for labeling. What do they look like? Uh, the swabs, ma'am? Yes. Uh, like I said, it's a long-handled uh, Q-tip, uh, similar to uh, what you see at a doctor's office. And you indicated well, how do you use them? So in uh, this case, when I was uh, swabbing the door handles for DNA, I would uh, open up two swabs, uh, moisten them with sterile water, and then um, run them around the door handles in an effort to collect up any biologic material that may have been on that door handle. I'll then uh, cap the swabs uh, put them inside of a box, seal them up, and then place them in an envelope. And is that standard policy and procedure for you to, when you utilize a swab? Yes. And did you consistently use that process anytime you used a swab at 69 Wells? Yes. Uh, now, you indicated you swabbed the, uh, the doors, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Why would you swab the doors first? Uh, just in case it was an unknown intruder uh, coming through one of those points of entry, hopefully we would be able to pick up some sort of uh, suspect DNA, unknown DNA. Well, the court is going to interject here. The court believed the testimony was that he swapped the door handles. I was just going to clarify that if I can, Your Honor. Um, if I may approach, Your Honor. Uh, the state is intending to introduce multiple photographs. I believe I need to have uh, the witness view them for ID right. at this point, if I may. May I have a word with counsel privately for a moment, Your Honor?
agreement about making this move a little faster, so. If we can, Your Honor, well, I'm going to do that. If I may just approach the yeah. witness. This is nine, pardon me, Your Honor, I apologize. Nine, okay, it's nine. Uh, nine A has been marked for ID, Your Honor. If I can. Sir, I'm going to show you. Please don't flip the page. If you look at the. I believe this would be page two off of 9A. Can we take a look at that document, please? <clears throat> now, there are about four photographs on that document. This is under nine, states nine. It's a uh, file labeled 169 Wells. Your Honor, with four photographs on it. Sir, do you recognize those photographs that are contained on that, that page? Yes. And what are those photographs? Those are uh, overall views of the four sides of the scene. Do those pictures fairly and accurately represent the scene of 69 Wells as you saw it that night on, or that morning, I should say, on 525-2019? Yes. They would offer the file labeled 169 Wells off of States 9 as a full exhibit. Is there an object? Oh, two. Well, nine is still ID, so these four are, not, they're all on one disc. That's the problem. So I'm not objecting to these four being shown to the jury. And just for expedience, Your Honor, I'm going to run through all of them if I can. Is it identified as nine or nine A? Nine A is for ID only at this point. I believe a nine, uh, well, both are for ID only. Nine A is the document is screenshots of every file or photograph contained within nine. So instead of pulling the photograph up on the computer, uh, council has agreed to let me show those screenshots for a authenticate each photograph. Save some time. So nine will be admitted as a full exhibit. Um, I have to run through all of them. Council is not in agreement oh, okay. at this point. Thank you. If I may, can I may just approach your honor? Yes. So I'm gonna show you Page two, actually it might be page three, under file marked two, garage pictures in states nine. Can you take a look at that, that page and only that page, sir? Sir, did you have an opportunity to look at those? Yes, ma'am. Do you recognize any of the photographs that are contained on that page? Yes. Um, how many do you recognize? I recognize them all. Okay. Uh, do they fairly and accurately port? Well, what are they? I'm sorry. Uh, photos one through five appear to be uh, overall photographs of the garage at 69 Wells. Uh, photograph six is the uh, photograph of the doorknob of the door in between the garage and the mudroom at 69 Wells. And photos seven, eight, and nine are photographs of the doorknob uh, after removal and during processing. And do those photographs all fairly and accurately portray those items that you described? Yes. And that's with respect to what they look like on May 25th, 2019? Yes. Okay. So they would offer that file, which I believe, if I can, is dates nine, file two, labeled garage pictures. No objection. So states nine, file two, admitted as full. If I may, Your Honor, states nine. A again, so I'm going to have you take a look at state file three, uh, labeled kitchen, and the majority of them. I will pull up the last one on the computer. But if you can take a look, please. Do you have an opportunity to look at that? Yes. 
Thank you. I would also direct your attention to the screen right in front of you. Um, do you see that screen in front of you? Yes. So just for the record, Your Honor, there is, so the record is clear, there is a screen in front of Detective Riley that only can be shown to him. The screen on the back of uh, Detective Riley that is portrayed towards the jury is off. Um, sir, do you recognize what's depicted in the screen in front of you? Yes. Okay, both the screen in front of you as well as the document in front of you as well. Do you recognize those photographs? Uh, I do. Uh, could you pull up uh, photograph 17? I know they're small. Can you? Thank you. Attorney Moran is assisting, Your Honor. Thank you. And again, it is only for the record shown on the screen in front of you. Do you recognize the photograph 17? Yes. So all those photographs that you just saw, they fairly and accurately portray. Well, I should ask this. What, do they, what are they? Uh, the photographs uh, appear to be overall views of the kitchen. Those are photographs one through four. Uh, photograph five and six appear to be um, the contents of the purse we found in the house. Seven, eight, well, nine. Your Honor, um, before he gets into a description of items not yet in evidence, um, I would like at least the opportunity of voir dire about, uh, about this set before I object or not object. I haven't even finished asking him what, if it is a fair and accurate representation of what he intends for it to be, Your Honor. I would ask to finish that before. Right, because the court will permit the voir dire after counsel lays the foundation. Thank you. You can continue, sir. Um, and uh, photos seven, through 15 were taken during processing of the kitchen. Photo 16, uh, an item of evidence that we seized from uh, Master Bath. And photo 17 is an exhibit that was seized from the garage floor. Uh, do you recognize all the items on the, that piece of paper? Yes. As well as the screen in front of you? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, do they fairly and accurately portray what you um, explain them to be on May 25th, 2019. Yes. A uh, state would offer it at this time, Your Honor. Brief, what do you yeah. uh, Mr. Riley, I just want to be clear as we go through these. Um, and let's start with the image you see on the screen, which on the sheet is marked as 18-352. That's on the screen. When you were at the scene, is this precisely how it appeared that you yourself saw? Uh, yes. It was like that, that we're seeing in the picture, you observe that at, at precisely as this image portrays it. Correct. All right. And if you look at the other images, one through 17, when you were in the house doing your job of collecting evidence, did everything that you observe it, um, appearing precisely as is shown in these images, these specific images. Yes. So that it not only fairly accurately represents the way that the uh, room appeared in general, but you yourself saw these exactly as they're laid out here. Is that correct? Yes. Then I'm not going to object to these pictures, Your Honor. So what is the offer? Uh, at this point, Your Honor, we're still on states nine. Council has approved. Uh, it has been, sorry, Your Honor has admitted uh, files one, which is 69 wells on that. File two, which is garage pictures. And file three, which is labeled kitchen. The state is now moving on to file four, which is titled uh, 69 Wells Latent Prints. So one, two, and three are full already? Already, Your Honor. So just so that the record is clear, one, two, and three admitted as full. And just for Your Honor, it, there are 15. So take a minute and take a look at file four. Yep. Do 
you recognize the items depicted in those photographs? Yes. Um, what are they? Uh, they're photographs of latent prints that we developed in uh, seas at the scene. What day did you seize those or develop those latent prints? Uh, we uh, fingerprinted the house on the 27th, so on Monday. On the 27th? Do those photographs that you see in front of you fairly and accurately portray the prints you photographed or developed, I should say, on 527? Yes. State would offer. I just want to be clear. You were there on the 25th. Is that right? Correct. I just understood this testimony is this is something that happened not on the 25th, correct? These pictures? That's right. Were you back there on the 27th after these pictures were taken? I was there on the 27th while those pictures were taken. Oh, while they were being taken. Yes. So you're there on two different days. Yes. And do these images that are in folder four, the one, two, three, four, five, six images, do they represent the way that uh, the, the particular parts of that house appeared as you were there? They uh, depict the way the scene appeared on the 27th. That, that's not my question. Do they, what we're looking at now in these images, do they appear exactly as when you were there, you observed them with the particular markings and, and whatever chemicals they sprayed? Is yes. That a, yeah, that's a yes. Yes. Right. So, the, so you saw these images precisely as they're portrayed. In other words, you were there either at the time these pictures were taken or immediately thereafter, right? Yes. I have no objection. Stage nine, file four, submitted as a full. Thank you. Sir, I'm going to draw your attention. State 9, file 5, titled uh, Chevy Lapple. Please take a look at those items. Now, sir, with respect to items labeled 2 through 6, do you recognize uh, what is depicted in those photographs? Yes, I do. What is depicted in those photographs? So that is the uh, the Chevy Suburban that was found on Lapham Road, um, as it appeared on the twenty on the morning of the twenty fifth. Uh, do those photographs fairly and accurately portray what that vehicle looked like on that morning on May twenty fifth, two thousand and nineteen? As as I found it, yes. Okay. Uh, with the state would offer those, Your Honor, the Item, the first item has already been admitted by a previous witness. And I'm not objecting to that one either. I do, if I may just follow up the same question. And to be clear, you were at the um, Lapham Road location and you observed the vehicle in that location at the time you were doing your evidence collection on that day? Yes, we drove from the scene to Lapham Road. And the vehicle was exactly as portrayed in these pictures, right? That's how I found it, correct. Okay. Again, I have no objection there. Stage 9, file 5, admitted as a full exhibit. Thank you. Stage 9, file 6, titled Mirage A. Sir, uh, I'm going to ask you to take a look at the photograph and depicted on the page, and then if you can, there are two, uh, there is a photograph being pulled up on your screen. For the record, the video screen behind the witness is off. The video screen in front of him is on. With respect to pictures 12 and 13, they are side by side on your screen in front of you. If you could take a look at all those photographs, please. Sir, do you recognize those photographs? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, what are they? Uh, 
there are photographs of uh, the garage floor. It's 69 wells during processing. And by during processing, is that, is that something that you were present for? Yes. Okay. Did you look at those items that are depicted in those photographs? Do they fairly and accurately portray what you saw that day on May 25th, was it? I believe these were taken on the 27th. On May 27th, 2019, and you were present on May 27th when those photographs were taken? Yes. Uh, and do they fairly and accurately represent what those photographs, uh, or what those items contained in the photographs are. Yes. State would offer. Does it have water here? Yes, please. And, and if I could just inquire with counsel for a second. Mm -hmm. The other two items, Your Honor, contained in uh, file six uh, have already been admitting, admitted through uh, Sergeant Pearson. Pearson. And just, I'm gonna ask you the, kind of the same question. When you were in the garage, was it, did it look exactly like this with the tape measures and the other uh, crime van uh, measuring devices that we see in these images? During our processing, yes, this is how it looked. I'm sorry, uh, would you say that again, please? During processing, this is how it looked. Well, I'm asking whether while you were there, were, were these items laid out as shown in these pictures while you were collecting evidence? Yes. So the two that are on the uh, screen, which are identified as um, in subfile 6, garage A, numbers 12 and 13, which don't appear in the, in the, on the sheet but are on the screen, this, these two show exactly how it appeared while you were in the in that garage. Yes. So the red dot on the on the van measuring thing was already there. Is that correct? The red dot. in the in the picture on the right that says A seventeen. I just want to specify which one we're looking at. That was there while you were there. Correct. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. When you say you don't know. I don't remember exactly what every marking looked like, but this is, this represents um, two of the stains you saw, on the garage floor. All right, well, I get that. We've seen a lot of pictures of stains. Well, my question is, we're talking about the white metric measuring devices. You recognize those from being the, from the van, correct? Correct. So I asked you about the red dot or stain you see on the thing that's marked A17. Was that there when you were in the uh, garage? So does that fairly and accurately represent what you saw? Uh, I don't remember that. You do not remember that? I don't. And then if you look at the image on the left that has an A16 on it, you see there's also a stain on the measuring device as well. Is that correct? Correct. Was that there? when you were present in the garage? Uh, I don't specifically remember that. All right. I just have a moment. Um, except for the two images on the screen, 12 and 13, I object. I don't believe this witness can categori uh, categorically state that this fairly and accurately represents the way it appeared while he was present. If I may, Your Honor, 12, and what counsel is equivocating is over a small dot on a, on a marking uh, tap, not even on the garage floor or a marking on the house, on the ruler that is used to the delineate uh, what I guess is a measurement system. I'm going to, to object to it. her describing the exhibit that's not yet in evidence. Then I have a right to argue this and admit it. Well, the jury cannot see what this is. That's correct. There may be questions that the court has that will be offered outside of the presence of the jury. 
because the court wants to make sure, first of all, that understands what, apparently what this exhibit is, is on the court screen. That's correct. correct. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I know this becomes somewhat inconvenient, but the court may have some questions about what you cannot see, which is not yet in evidence. So perhaps we'll just take an early afternoon recess and reconvene at 315. All rise. This honorable Supreme Court now stands in recess until 315.
the court sees on its screen. The court does not know if states nine file six, is that correct? Uh, yes, your honor, states nine file six, pictures 12 and 13. And, on the, and 14, your honor, although that one hasn't been put on the screen. Well, the court That's wouldn't see the those numbers 12 and 13 on the screen. That would be on the hard copy, your honor. I have a... Uh, no, only 1213. He's also talking about 14. What the court sees is A16 and A17. Yes, Your Honor. And so that would correspond yeah. to which numbers? Uh, 12 and 13. Right? 12 and 13. And Attorney Schoenhorn was in the process of basically voir dire-ing on 12 and 13. Consider the what was suspected an objection uh, to be shown on. The court is going to make a distinction between authentication and the concerns of to be shown on. What the court is looking at is a measuring device and stains. Concerning authentication, the measuring device is what it appears to be, a measuring device. In both 12 and 13, they both purport to be measuring devices. The court sees that there is no controversy concerning whether they are measuring devices. The question is whether those measuring devices appeared that way when a Detective Riley saw them. Is that correct? Because he indicated that he doesn't remember the red dot on 13 and the marking on 12. Well, the question I was asked is whether these fairly and accurately depict what he saw, and if it, you know, there's a lot of other pictures, but if they didn't, I'll just note, Your Honor, although it wasn't put up on the screen, number 14, the next picture, uh, also has a red, what looks like another drop, um, and what's, why this is important, Your Honor, is because if these, some of these small drops are blood-like. This is the, the, what's on the measuring device. Also, looks the same. It's the same color. May also be blood-like. So the suggestion that there is more than what was actually there. That's the problem with my, with the way the question was asked. This goes in suggests there's more. Maybe that. Maybe that's blood. Maybe they dropped it on there while they were collecting it. But this witness is not the one to testify about it. That's why it's important to the defense. And I don't know if there seems to be another similar marking on picture 14, the next one. I don't know if Your Honor just wants me to, instead of- We'll take the representation that there's another stain on 14. Right. But the question to this witness is, as the court heard the question, is this how these two exhibits, ID exhibits, appeared to you when you saw them? He said, I do not remember the stain on 12. And I do not remember this chain on 13. So now the question becomes admissibility. So the jury is going to hear that testimony. I do not remember what's on 12, the marking on 12. I do not remember that dot on 13. And the objection is, well, there's no indication that this fairly and accurately depicts what Detective Riley saw on the 25th of May or the 27th of May. For the record, I think it's detective, former Detective Riley, not 
I think Your Honor used the name Clavi, I think, just for the record. Well, she thought it said Lowry, nevertheless. And the court is just going to indicate what it, its ruling will be. The court is focused on the authentication of the measuring device. The jury is going to hear this. That didn't appear to be what I saw on that date. And leave any cross-examination if they are admitted to counsel. Because it is going to be obvious that the jury is going to think, how did a reddish looking stain that appears on a measuring device get on a measuring device? Whereas the stains on the garage floor allegedly were there two days before the measuring device showed up. That's going to be what they think. But this is the state's offer. You can bring the jury back in. Your Honor, before the jury comes back, there is one other issue. The court overruled the objection regarding the testimony regarding whether the reagent or presumptive, the reason for this witness's actions. But there's going to be an effort in the next 10 minutes, I assume, to try and offer, looks like, I can't tell from just the image, I'd have to call it up on the computer, three, perhaps four images of somebody taking a picture with a night camera of the glow, which I submit is a separate issue of whether or not he, because I can't cross-examine the images, and I would ask that that be at least addressed outside the presence of the jury as to whether or not he was wearing, I don't know, special glasses to take the swab at the time, because the pictures are more prejudicial, in my view, unfairly prejudicial than the testimony that he did it because of the presumptive test using either the inositol or the KM. If I can just direct counsel to the screen, are these the ones, if I can? Because I do actually agree, I'd rather get this out while the jury is out of the room, if I could just have one minute. This would be under file 14, Chevy Suburban, and is this what counsel's talking about? I believe that is correct. So this would be file 14, Chevy Suburban, this photograph is just labeled 14, then there's 15, and then 16. I believe those are, are those the three? Let me just have a moment. I have to call it up on my computer, Your Honor, because the image is just so black. In other words, I can't tell from the paper copy, so if I just have a moment. Oh, could you just show me the other ones again? Okay, this is 16, so this would be 15, and then this is 14. Yes, those would be the, those are the images that I would be objecting to. The later testing showed that this was not blood, and these three images, which I don't know if Your Honor can see them, they don't aid the court, the jury in any event, and the fact of putting it in has no probative value whatsoever, but it will certainly make the jury confused to think it was evidence of blood when it's going to be in a week or two shown that it had nothing to do, that it was not blood. Your Honor, again, I feel like this is a backdoor to Your Honor's ruling already this morning that the state can offer testimony regarding the presumptive test, not only the luminol, but the KM, Castle-Meyer test. Counsel can, of course, cross-examine Detective Riley as well as any lab witnesses, present any case he wishes to do. 
But like Your Honor indicated earlier, it goes to its weight, not its admissibility. Uh, and this was uh, something Your Honor decided and is allowed. So just by virtue of the fact that it's a luminal test, I don't think affects at this point its admissibility. Now, uh, when we get to authenticating the photograph, I guess I can do that now outside the presence of the jury. We can go through the motions if Your Honor wishes. Well, the court does not think this is a difficult matter to resolve. The state, of course, the state has its strategy, but the state can ask its witness, is this a conclusive test? This luminol test can show not only blood, but 30 other substances. Isn't that right? So the court sees no unfair prejudice. This is the state's presentation. The court sees no unfair prejudice. And again, the court can ask how many substances would the luminol test detect if it is unclear. So the court sees no unfair prejudice at this stage. Would the court at least permit short voir dire about these three images so we're not taking up time in front of the jury and then I just, my issue is preserved for the record. Well, the court thinks the voir dire is just as short as the court made it. This can show 30 substances, correct? But he hasn't answered it. Well, no, I'm not asking. But that's as far as the court can ask that while the jury is here. If the court is unclear. Well, I don't even know if he was present when these pictures were taken, whether he saw it. Well, I think that because counsel knows the case, it may be that counsel is assuming that the jury is going to draw certain conclusions, not based on what's coming in now, but based on what counsel knows about the case. If this is shown to the jury, just this photo with some testimony as to this is what the luminol test showed. The court can see no unfair prejudice in that and cross-examination that this isn't conclusive. Well, more to the point, Your Honor, I would submit that this witness doesn't have the proper background or authentication or experience to testify that what it shows other than it's a glowing purple image in the dark. You would need someone with scientific background to explain what the luminol is and what it shows, not a hearsay statement by a detective. What the court can envision is this is, I sprayed this section colloquially with luminol and that's what happened. Now, where that testimony goes from there will have to be heard. I think the objection would have to come after that point. Just to say this is the result that we saw is not prejudicial, unfairly. What does it mean? That's the next question. What does it mean? Well, is the court going to preclude that next question or wait for an objection on that? That's why we're doing this outside the presence of the jury. Well, it depends on what the state is going to try to get in. The court indicated what the question, the threshold question would be, and then the court has to see where it goes from there. May I make a suggestion with respect to the luminol of those photographs, Your Honor? I think a lot of their, what would, for their foundation, it is in file 14 out of 15 for a reason. As Your Honor can see through the many, many photographs that the state intends to introduce, that there will be a lot of 
a lot of testimony concerning what was found in the garage as well as Detective Riley's reasoning and his training experience and his determination. I'm not simply going to put the photograph up and have it conveyed for what it is. There will be a foundation for it. Perhaps we should wait until that time uh, is uh, at hand, I guess, uh, for that determination. And what I will do is just mark before those pictures come up and we can do an offer of proof outside the presence of the jury uh, with Detective Riley on the stand. Okay, the court would prefer not to have the jury keep going out this afternoon. So if we can, uh, if we can go back to the other 12 and 13. Oh. So that that's where we are at this point. Yes, Your Honor. Um, and actually, can I? Your Honor, just for the record, if I can also, this is on a side note, apparently when, even though the TV is off and it is something not being streamed, I know that this is a, something that is live streamed, the ID issues are being, that are seen on the camera feed are still being shown. So the whole point is the jury doesn't see it off of the screen. However, it is being still uh, live streamed, the ID issues. So. That apparently is something we did discover during the, the break. But I want to make it very clear that the screen behind the jury has been off, and we will ensure that the camera or the video camera on the side is off as well. Thank this, before we put up, is now back on the screen, is 12 and 13. I will leave the video in front of uh, Detective Riley down until Your Honor indicates. I can put it back up. So the last line of questioning from Attorney Schoenhorn essentially was those marks on those measuring devices, Detective Riley did not see at the time he was at the property on the, either the 25th or the 27th. I, that's not my memory, Your Honor. My memory, and I, perhaps Detective Riley can indicate, is that he does not recall seeing he does not those recall two marks. Seeing, correct. And that's the last line that the court heard. Correct. And that it therefore does, the, this witness cannot testify that it, that image fairly and accurately represents what is in the image at the time he was present. That's my argument. And the state's offer, Your Honor, is with respect to, to the, uh, the what's at issue is the markings on the garage floor a small mark contained on the measuring document that either uh, Detective Riley or one of the other officers actually put down there uh, does not make the document move at this point. The court's view is that the measuring, we call them devices, all what they purport to be in the photograph. The conclusions that the jury draws about how those stains arrived on those measuring devices is going to be up to the jury. Bring the jury back in. Counsel stipulate to the presence of all of the jurors. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Yes, sir. Your Honor. When we left, counsel was still on board here. I, I've finished my voir dire, so um, I'll just note that my objection is that this witness cannot state that these two <coughs> images, and I'll note, I make the same claim with regard to number 14 in this. Uh, package um, fairly and accurately represents what he observed that day. So I'll just 
the line. Can we make objection. sure the day we're talking about is clear? Is this the 25th or the 27th? May I inquire, Your Honor, just to get it from Detective Riley? Uh, sir, do you recall what day those photographs were taken? Yes, these were taken on the 27th. The objection is overruled. Of this state's nine file six. Yes, sir. State's nine file six will be admitted as full. Thank you. May I approach the witness again, Your Honor? If I can. Again, states nine A. Sir, if you could take a look at what's been marked as file seven, garage B. If you could take a few minutes and take a look at those photographs. Do you recognize what's depicted on those pages, please? Uh, yes, I do. What is depicted on those pages? Uh, they are photographs of the garage floor as we were processing it and some of the items of evidence that we um, observed and collected. And as you were processing, what day? This would have been on the, again, on the 27th. Do those photographs fairly and accurately portray what those uh, items looked like on May 27, 2019? Uh, yes. Uh, the state would offer, Your Honor, there's also a PDF, but that has already been admitted. Same Bloodier. Bloodier. Yes, um, and I just want to clarify now with this folder marked number seven, garage B, does this folder, are all the images in there, as you recall it, that it fairly and accurately represents what you saw on that date of May 27th? Yes. I have no objection to this folder, Your Honor. Thank you. States nine, file seven, admitted as a full. Thank you. Actually, I'm show you states nine, file eight, file garage C. If you take a look at those photographs, um, for the record, Your Honor, the screen behind the witness is dark and uh, the screen um, in front of him is pulled up. If you can also take a look at that screen when you have a moment, sir. Do you recognize the items depicted in those photographs? Yes. What are they? Uh, again, it's the garage um, of the residence and some of the stains uh, found on the garage floor and on the uh, and uh, the photograph depicted on the screen is uh, something we found on the interior face of one of the garage doors. And what day are we talking uh, about? This would be on the 27th as well. Do those photographs fairly and accurately portray uh, what you indicated they are? Yes. The state would offer it? Make the same inquiry, may I, Your Honor? Yes. I'm going to ask the same question just so that I'm being consistent. If you look at the images in this subfolder on this uh, disk, um, number eight, you look at all the images, including the one that's on the screen because it didn't print because it's a PDF or it's an actual an NEF, which I don't even know what that is. But do all of these images, including the one on the screen, fairly and accurately represent what you saw that evening, including whatever uh, measuring devices are depicted in them. Yes. I have no objection to this folder. States 9, file 8, <coughs> admitted as full. Thank you. Sir, if I may. <coughs> Nine, file nine, labeled for a B. So if you could take a few moments, please, and look at that document. And could you bring up a 
photograph 10, please? Um, photograph 10. Uh, yeah, 371. Yes. Thank you. Uh, next one, please. Thank you. Do you recognize what's depicted on that yes. screen in front of you? And for the record, again, the screen behind you is, is blank or dark? Yes. Again, this is uh, the garage floor at 69 Wells and some of the exhibits that we found. And, uh, and standing that we found on the floor. Now, with respect to these images, were they taken on different days or the same day? Do you uh, recall? Well, I know that um, 371 was taken on the 25th. And 371, are you indicating that's the one right in front of you? Uh, correct. 10-371? Yes. Okay. And the others? The others uh, appear to be taken on the 27th. Okay. On each of the images that are portrayed on uh, that document, sir, do each of them fairly and accurately depict what you saw on both the 25th and then 27th for the image in front of you? Yes. They would offer it. May I, what dear? Uh, could you just explain to me, you're saying that the, the particular image marked 10-371 was taken on a different day than the others that are in this image? Uh, in this well, subfolder, I mean? Yes. And what is it about that particular image that uh, you realize was taken on a different day? Uh, I recognize the exhibit, sir. Mm -hmm. And I know that I seized that exhibit on the 25th. When you say exhibit, just because it's not shown yet, you're talking about somebody wrote yeah. the word exhibit number and a number on it, right? Correct. That's in the actual photograph. Yes. And there seems to be some kind of green material to the left. Do you recall seeing that when you were there on the 25th? Uh, yes. And there seems to maybe be a... Uh, some curly thing that might be a piece of hair just above where the little measuring uh, device is. Do you recall seeing that? Yes. And you were present on for the other images as well on the 27th. The rest of the ones in the subfolder mark nine. Yes. And they look exactly the way or that you recall them appearing that the image appeared that's shown in these uh, photographs, correct? At some point during the processing, yes. While you were present, though. While I was present. All right. No objection to these images. Space 9, file 9, admitted as full. Thank you. If I may approach again. Thank you, sir. States 9, file 10, label garage E. Can you take a few moments, please, and review that document? I see a uh, three dash one eight six on the screen, please. And just for the record, the screen behind you is blank. The one in front of you should show that image. Yes, I recognize it. And with respect to each of the images contained on the document in front of you, sir, do you recognize each of those images? Yes. From what day? These were from uh, the 27th. And were you present for the, when these images were on the 27th for these images? Yes. Okay. And each of these, do they fairly and accurately portray what you saw that day? Yes. State would offer.
May I inquire, Judge? Yes. Can you look at the, uh, the image mark 4-187 in this subfolder? I'm going to ask you to uh, indicate to me whether or not the uh, stain or mark that's on the measuring device it appears to be the same color as the other spots was on the the measuring device when you were there on May, you said the 25th or the 27th for these pictures? Uh, these were on the 27th. Okay. So do you recall whether or not that stain drop was there when you, uh, that's depicted in that specific image 4-187? Uh, it doesn't look like a stain drop. It looks like some uh, plant material. Well, it's a bit now I'm talking about on top of the measuring device. You looked at the same picture? Yes. 4-187, there's a number 55 in the picture, right? So I'm talking about the right-hand smaller <coughs> measuring device. Yes. You see right in the middle of it, there, near the middle, there's a, there's a stain of some sort. I think that looks like a piece of plant material, sir. Oh, do you know whether it was there at the time? I'm just asking. Yes, there were plant material there on the floor at the time this photo was taken. And, and right on top of the measuring device, you're saying it fairly accurately represents, you recall it being there. On top of the measuring device? Yes. I don't remember specifically. All right, so um, I'm going to make that same objection with regard to this particular image. But the rest of them, I just want to be sure the others fairly and accurately represent the way you recall the uh, seen in, that's depicted in these images on that date, correct? Yes. Yeah, I'm only objecting to the one uh, image, Your Honor. Thank you. The objection is overruled. 6-9, file 10, admitted as full. Thank you. 6-9, sir, file 11, garage F. Please take a moment and take a look at that document. Do you recognize the photographs depicted in that on that page? Yes, I do. What are they? These are uh, various stains found on the garage floor at 69 Wells. Do you recall what day? These were, they appear to be taken on the 27th. And do each, in looking at each of those photographs, do they fairly and accurately portray what you saw the garage? You saw that day on the 27th in May of 2019? Yes. It would offer it. If I just could have one moment, Your Honor. Yes. The court cannot see that ID. Your Honor, it's a, actually, may I have a moment? Yes. <coughs> I thought I had an extra copy of this, Your Honor. But. Well, of course, the court will hear what the objection is after. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to just ask you the uh, same question. In this group that's in folder 10, garage E, do these all represent fairly and accurately what you yourself saw when you were there on that day? Yes. I'm not going to object to these. States 9, file 11. Correct? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Admitted as full. Thank you. Riley, from there. Sorry, Your Honor. States 9, file 12, uh, labeled Garage G. So if you could please take a look at that document. There will also be another photograph depicted on your screen in front of you. Just take a look at that. And uh, just for the record, again, the uh, screen behind the witness is blank. Please go on the screen with one picture.
Can I see 196, please? Uh, I believe that would be one. Uh, yes. I have the correct one on the screen. Thank you. So are you finished reviewing all those photographs? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize the photographs depicted both on the screen in front of you as well as the document in front of you? Uh, yes. Uh, do you recall on what day that these photographs were taken? These were taken on, again, on the 27th. And were you present when they were taken? Yes. And looking at each of the images on the document in front of you, as well as the screen in front of you, uh, do they fare with, well, I should ask this first. What are those images of? Uh, these are, the photos depict uh, an item of evidence that we found on the garage floor, as well as uh, staining. And some of the uh, processing methods that were used. And do these photographs fairly and accurately represent those items as you saw them on the day in May 27, 2019? Yes. They would offer them. Why, dear? I'm just going to ask you about um, the, the same question, but I'm going to ask about a specific image in here just to be clear. Um, you were present when all these items that are shown in these particular uh, images were on the floor or on the car, correct? Yes. And um, I'm going to ask you separately about 18, but all the rest of them, those fairly and accurately represent what you actually observed on May 27th, correct? Yes. I'm going to ask with regard to Exhibit 18, it's um, obviously not taken at the same time as the first image that's up on your screen, right? Correct. So were you present when somebody put these red strings down? Were you there for that? I was uh, there during that process, yes. Were you there when, it, when this picture was taken, which shows the process being completed? Yes, I saw the completed product. You did see that? Yes. All right. I don't object to these things, Judge. Page 9, file 12, admitted as full. States 9, file 13, table garbage cans. You take a look at that document. Do you recognize those photographs, sir? Uh, yes, I do. What are they? Uh, these are photographs of garbage cans that were found in the hay corner of the garage. And I'm taking a look at all the images on that page, sir. Uh, do you recall what day these photographs were taken? Uh, it appears... Uh, that 1, 2, 3, and 5 were most likely taken on the 25th, and 4 was taken on the 27th. <coughs> Now, with respect to taking each of those images um, in and of itself, because there are some five images, uh, do they fairly and accurately represent what the garbage cans look like on 525 and or 527? Yes. And um, is it the state would offer them, Your Honor? I want to clarify the disjunctive and or. So were did they all look like that that you observed on the 25th of May all in all these images whether one was taken on a different day or not uh, without regard to the scale that are depicted yes that's the way the garbage cans right. looked and the difference is on the 27th people somebody put the little scale stickers that's from the evidence van uh, it appears that uh, photo four, uh, somebody actually wrote on the, can I see photo four please?
We'll just call it up for you. Yes, uh, that photo there was definitely taken on the 27th. So if they have a little measuring thing and then there's somebody hand wrote something on it, that would, if it was handwritten on it, it's the 27th. If it's blank, it's maybe the 25th or the 27th, or we don't know. Just for this specific uh, item, uh, yes. Okay. And, and just so that I'm, I'm clear, as far as the garbage pail is concerned, do you know if they were in these exact positions when you were there or were they moved? Uh, in the first photograph is how they appeared <laughs> as we found them. Uh, and then during uh, you know, our examination and search, uh, they were probably open, maybe they moved slightly, but they were relatively in that same position. Okay, so relatively in the same position. Correct. Um, no objection. States 9, file 13, admitted as false. States 9, file 14. Labeled Chevy Suburban. Sir, if you can please take a look at that document. Okay. Do you recognize? Um, well, let me start with this. Uh, photographs uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Um, do you recall or do you know when those photographs were taken? Yes. When were they taken? These were taken on the 28th of May. 2019. And where, uh, what are the depictions of? They are depictions of the uh, Chevy Suburban uh, from uh, seas from Lapham Road in New Canaan. And these photographs were taken during processing of that vehicle at the New Canaan Police Department. Were you present for the processing of the vehicle? Yes. And were you present during uh, to see all of the items depicted in photographs yes right. now with respect if they with respect to items 1 through 16 do those photographs fairly and accurately depict uh, what they are portrayed in the images today yes right. now with respect to 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 and 26 were those taken on a different day uh, I see a photograph 22, please. And 24 as well, please. Okay. And just for uh, the record, the screen behind you is blank and these are all turned in. Thank you. So photograph 17 through 21 were taken on June 26th at Troop Chief Bridgeport. And were you present on uh, June 21st? Was it that the day? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I believe it was 26. 26. Were you present on June 26th? Yes. Uh, were you present for these photographs? Uh, yes. And do they fairly and accurately portray um, what they are depicted? Yes. What are they? Uh, these are um, uh, items or conditions that we found on the underside of that Chevy Suburban uh, seized on Lapham Road. And that was with respect to, I'm sorry, 18, 19, 20, and 21? Yes. Okay. And do they fairly and accurately portray, just to be clear, up to 21? Uh, yes. Okay. With respect to 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26, do you recognize those photographs? Yes. What are they? 
These are photographs of uh, latent prints uh, taken from say, the exterior of that Chevy Suburban. Uh, these were taken on uh, the 28th of May, 2019, at the New Canaan Police Department. Were you present when these photographs were taken? Yes. Uh, do they fairly and accurately depict uh, the, what you say, latent prints? Yes. Um, that, that were on the uh, vehicle that day? Yes. State would offer uh, the 9, final 14 in its entirety. May I? Right here. Um, I'm going to just separate out for the moment um, numbers 14, 15, and 16 for the moment. I'm just going to ask you about the rest of them in total. With regard to all of those images, one through um, 13, and then um, 17 through 26, were you present in the location where they're shown uh, that's, that, so that you could say that you what's being depicted in there, including fingerprints, you saw exactly what's in these images. Is yes. that correct? And on the day that it was taken, you were there, you saw it, right? Yes. So let me just ask you, there are three images that we, um, that there's images of, but on the paper copy, they basically look uh, black, okay? So my question is, um, these were taken at night, or were they taken in the dark, correct? Correct. Were you present when that was done? Yes. You were in the room when they turned off the light? Yes. And you watched them take the pictures? Yes. Those particular images um, um, were illuminated with a black light, is that correct? No. They were illuminated using a chemical, correct? Yes. And the um, photographs you were taken without a flash for those three images, correct? Correct. Can I just have a moment? Um, this was an issue that did arise before. I'm going to raise my objection, and depending in any event, I'm going to ask the court to give a limiting instruction regarding, but I don't object to 1 through 13 and 17 through 26 on subfolder 14. So what the court can do right now is just exclude photos 14 through 60 and admit pending argument and admit as full 1 through 13 uh, 17 through the balance as full Your Honor, just to, for the record, the state would be uh, attempting to introduce those throughout the course of the testimony um, at a later point uh, to hear once a foundation has been made. Uh, this is just to expedite the process of entering all the photographs, if I may. Uh, may I continue with the last folder? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Sir, states nine, folder 19, I'm um, sorry, not 19, 15, labeled Range Rover. Can you please take a look at that document? Yes, can I see photo 13, please?
Sir, do you see the photo reflected on the screen in front of you? Uh, yes. And photo eight, please. Okay, I recognize these. You do. Sir, with respect to photos um, one, well, plus you, are all those photos taken on the same day? Not sure about one and two, uh, but the rest were taken uh, three through twenty, three through thirteen were taken on the twenty seventh. So three through thirteen were taken on the twenty seventh. Where? Uh, at six. It's a at sixty nine Wells. Okay, and with respect to one and two. Uh, do you recognize what's depicted in those photographs? Yes, I do. I, and what is depicted in those photographs? That's a, um, the garage at 69 Wells. And anything else inside of those photographs? That's a, a Range Rover that was found parked in the center bay. With respect to one and two, when you were present at 69 Wells on May 25th and May 27th, uh, did the what is depicted, or does this photograph fairly and accurately depict uh, what the garage with the vehicle uh, look like? Uh, yes, it, yes, it does. And with respect to three through thirteen, um, were you present during those photographs? Yes. And do they fairly and accurately represent what they are depicted to be? Yes. Okay. Now, with respect to fourteen through eighteen, do you recall those? Yes, these were uh, photographs taken <laughs> of the Range Rover. Uh, during additional processing on June 26th at Troop G Bridgeport. And were you present for that additional processing? Yes. And do you recognize uh, these photographs and what's depicted in them? I do. And do they fairly and accur accurately depict uh, what you indicated they are to be? Yes. State would offer um, file 15, case 9. And what year? Mr. Rather, do you remember the question I'd asked you like 15 times now? Yes, I do. Is it the answer is the same for all these pictures? Yes. All right. I'm not going to object to this. Thank you. States 9, file 15, admitted as full. Thank you. And I can you just go to the Sergeant Riley, um, I want to talk about May 25th, okay? Um, to, well, May, the night of May 24th into May 25th, 2019. Uh, you indicated you arrived at 69 Wells at about 2 o'clock in the morning? Approximately, ma'am, yes. Okay. Uh, what, what did you do when you first arrived? Um, when I first arrived on scene, I... Uh, Parked the van in the cul-de-sac. Uh, we took a walk up the driveway um, to basically clear it of any uh, items of evidentiary value, and then uh, we we parked the van in in the driveway and awaited a search warrant. Did you write a search warrant? I did not. I, just for uh, clarity, uh, what is a search warrant? A uh, search warrant is uh, authorizations signed by a judge that authorizes uh, police officers to enter and search a, a premises or person. 
Was a search warrant obtained for 69 Wells that night or that morning, I should say? Uh, yes. Did you review that? Uh, I did. At what time did you review that search warrant? I would say approximately, uh, approximately four o'clock in the morning. Okay. And after, and I believe it, what was your assignment again for 69 Wells that day? Uh, evidence collection. Uh, if I can, sir, I'm going to draw your attention to states nine um, to the screen behind you, which is not on. Thank you. <coughs> states nine, file one. If you could take a look behind you, sir. Do you recognize that photograph? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, when you arrived that night, did um, what did you? Well, what do you recognize that to be? By the way, uh, that's the uh, scene at sixty nine Wells. And when you say you went up the driveway and parked the van, can you show where you went? If you wouldn't mind standing up, sorry, Your Honor, oh, is, sure. is it okay if he? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Oh, when I did park the van up, uh, up on the hill, it was, it was over in this direction here. Um, it may have been left out of the overall photographs. Okay, and uh, picture two out of that same file, sir. Uh, do you recognize that area? Yes. Uh, that is the, uh, the exterior of the garage, the 69 wall. And is this what the exterior of the garage looked like the morning? Uh, of 525? That's as we found it. That's as you. Is this a, well, if I can. And then this photograph, sir? Uh, that is a photo of the back of the house, the 69 walls. Now, I believe you uh, testified a little bit ago uh, about uh, taking swabs off of doors. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, are there, where you took the swabs that day, are, is that depicted in those photographs? Uh, some, some of the point of entry, yes. Could you please point those out? Yes, here, uh, the mudroom door, and here, these French patio doors. Okay, and just for the record, that's the middle part of the photograph? Uh, yes. Okay. What about uh, picture four? As a photo of the uh, side of the house, I believe that's the, the east side of the house. Okay. And uh, in about the middle, I guess lower, uh, is that a door as well? Yes. Did you swab that door? I did. And when I say swab it, did you utilize that same process that you spoke about earlier? Yes, I did. Okay. Now, were you wearing gloves when you conducted each of those swabs? Yes. Do you change your gloves? Yes. Uh, tell me why? Uh, because we're looking for uh, minute quantities biologic material, and we didn't want to contaminate it with F1 uh, biologic material. How so often would you change your gloves? Uh, when conducting these DNA swabs, uh, after every sample. So every time you swabbed a item, you would change your gloves? Yes. Okay. Did you have any other protective gear on? Uh, I was wearing a uh, face mask. And I'm actually going to go back to the front first photograph, sir. Um, and if I can just zoom in a little bit on that. Is there a area that you swabbed on the front of the house depicted in that photograph? Yes, the, uh, the front door here. Okay. And it, did you change your gloves for that as well? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you can have a seat for now, sir. Thank you. Now, on that day in um, on May 25th, 2019, uh, you were the evidence officer, is that correct? Yes. Okay, can you again just explain what that means? So it was my responsibility to uh, uh, 
uh, identify uh, items that we were going to seize and ensure that they were uh, uh, documented properly. Um, any kind of uh, measurement that needed to be taken was taken. Uh, any kind of field testing um, I would conduct and then I would be responsible for the collection, the packaging, the labeling, okay. and the reporting. Is there a particular area of the house that on May 25th, 2019, you started with? Um, Actually, I'll just, if I can, just show you. I'll start showing you some of the photographs. We'll start with this as uh, dates nine file to, I believe, uh, picture one. Uh, did you enter the garage on May 25th, 2019? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, was the garage door open when you arrived? As yes. As it is in that photograph? When we arrived, that center bay door was open. Were there officers on scene when you arrived? Yes. And were there officers inside the garage when you arrived? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. But the door was open? The door was open. Okay. Now, as you entered the garage, did you, um, where did you go or what did you do? So, um, so once we uh, obtained a search, search warrant, we began our walkthrough and I entered the garage, um, entered the rest of the home through the door at the front of the Range Rover and went and opened the, uh, the front door to allow uh, additional members of the, the team in. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph, sir? Yes, that is the uh, right side of the garage. And is that how you saw it that day? Uh, yes. Okay. And further, that was states two, the picture two, this is picture three. Um, and what does that photograph depict? That's a, again, a photo, photograph of the right side of the garage. Okay. And picture four? That is the left side of the garage. And picture five? Uh, the center of the garage taken from uh, one of the corners uh, looking at the uh, the door that would lead into the, the mudroom and kitchen of the first floor. Is that the door that you entered the house on? That I initially did, yes. Was it locked? Um, I don't think so, ma'am. I'm going to show you file or picture six. Uh, what does that photograph depict? That is a photograph of the uh, that door to the mudroom. Uh, this is the what I call the exterior side or the the garage side of the door. And uh, on that doorknob, uh, we found a, um, a a visible fingerprint or what appeared to us to be a visible fingerprint. And that's why you see the the scale uh, the mark up there. Now, prior, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions of that, but before I do, um, what information had you been given prior to, as, strike that, as the evidence officer, it was your job to determine what, uh, if anything, would be found for evidentiary value and seized, is that correct? Uh, yes, as other members of the team, if, if they saw something, they would bring it to my attention, and then I would uh, decide whether or not we were going to seize it. So at this point, when you entered the house as the, as, as the evidence officer, what information had you have that allowed you to make these decisions? Objection, hearsay, and date. Well, the evidence so far, as the court understood the evidence, is that he read the warrant affidavit. Yes, sir. So if that is the objection, if the testimony goes beyond that, the court can hear another objection, but if the answer is you read the warrant affidavit, no, I'm not going to object to that. My next question, Your Honor, is what is the information that contained in that warrant affidavit that helped you or guided you in making your decisions? So I'm going to object on hearsay and relevance ground. You got a warrant, so we took his actions. The objection is sustained. Okay. Uh, I can, Your Honor. Um, 
Sir, why were you there at 69 Wells that day? Uh, the Jackson asked an answer. Well, at this point it becomes preliminary. He was involved in a missing persons investigation. That's preliminary, it's already been established. Okay. Now, I'm gonna draw your attention to the photograph right behind you, sir, photograph six um, on, I believe, file two. Now I'm gonna scroll in if I can. Uh, do you see that marking or that measurement? Yes. What, it, what is it? Uh, that is how I would designate uh, what was gonna be seized. I would, um, you know, assign it, you know, our version of the exhibit, we call it an exhibit, that's the EX. We'll give it a sequential number uh, for identification purposes, and we'll either write it on some sort of label or we'll uh, drop one of those, uh, you know, plastic tents or placards with a number on it to, to, to uh, denote it. And so why did you give this number a designation of Exhibit 12? Um, because on this side, uh, it was pretty clearly visible a, uh, a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. And then on the reverse side of it, we saw what uh, possibly looked like some blood-like stains. Um, so, I mean, given um, what we had seen in the garage during our walkthrough, uh, we found that this was probably a, a pretty valuable piece of evidence. A couple questions. It, can you see, well, you indicated a fingerprint was, visi was visible? Yes. Was that after any kind of um, reagent or testing was done on it or before? No, it was, it was clearly visible to the naked eye. Could you see it on that photograph um, behind you, please? If you could take a look. Uh, not very well. I can't see any rich detail. <laughs> on the photograph? Okay. And with respect to the Exhibit 12, what exactly is that in reference to the, I guess that's not a good question, but is the Exhibit 12 the fingerprint or is it the, the um, doorknob or is it the door that it's on? Well, this is, uh, it was my intent to seize the entire doorknob. So Exhibit 12 represents the doorknob. Okay. Did you seize the entire doorknob? Yes. Well, the question the court asked counsel, does that include the plate behind the door? Uh, yes, Your Honor. If I can. Oh, I do have to zoom out. There. Uh, picture seven. What is that depict, sir? Uh, that is the uh, the doorknob uh, after I had fumed it with uh, it was super glue, uh, cyan cyanoacrylate. Um, and this is, uh, this was taken in the van, uh, prior to final packaging. Okay. If you could walk me through, please, um, pretty much everything you said, uh, how did you seize it? We'll start with that. So, um, again, I, I Don new gloves, um, you know, wore a face mask and very carefully unscrewed it from the door. Uh, without trying to disrupt either the fingerprint or any of uh, the apparent stains on the interior side of it. Um, prior to doing this, I had set up a, a small fuming tent uh, on the van. And this is uh, a small device that we use. Uh, we secure uh, the doorknob inside uh, that fuming tent once I removed it. We put a small uh, hot plate with a small amount of uh, super glue or crazy glue on that hot plate. It creates fumes inside the plastic tent and uh, the fumes uh, polymerizer kind of cement that print in place. So there's no chance of it being destroyed inside of the, uh, the box that I eventually secured. So it can get to the lab in one piece and the, the lab can uh, can examine it. How long did it stay in the super glue tent? Uh, 
Usually I'll set a timer for 10 or 12 minutes and I'll just start checking it. It really depends on uh, the item itself, the humidity. Uh, I keep a close eye on it because uh, like fingerprint dust, if, if you over fume it, you'll destroy the print. And um, how do you package it after the fuming is done? So after this was done, I secured it in a, a, a cardboard box with uh, zip ties. Was it given any kind of evidence number? Uh, yes, uh, we designated it as uh, State Police Exhibit 12. Now, with respect to State Police Exhibit 12, is there also a number that is given to the exhibits to delineate it in association with the case you're there for? Um, well, that's a, if I could rephrase that, is there an incident number or an evidence number that's associated with this uh, investigation? Uh, yes, there is. And that's, that's where a little confusion comes in. So we have a uh, we have a state police case number that we worked under. Initially, this was going to be simply an assist to New Canaan. Um, all of our numbers, uh, all of our uh, exhibits are just numbered sequentially from one to whatever in order. Those are our numbers. That's for our documentation purposes. The intent was to turn these over all of our exhibits over to the New Canaan Police Department. And usually the local police departments will put their own evidence labels on it, which could have a different number. Again, it's just, it's just a tracking number for the individual departments. Then once it gets to the laboratory, the laboratory will sign it yet a, another number. So. Um, now, you mentioned that this was originally an assist to New Canaan. What does that mean? So uh, again, New Canaan uh, asked the state police for assistance in this missing person investigation. Um, we do that on occasion. Um, so we will provide, usually we'll provide crime scene services to the police, to the local police department at the conclusion of which we will turn over all the evidence or photographs, all of our reports. So the local police department can continue on with their, with their case. Um, sometimes they will ask for additional detectives, which we will supply. Basically, we do as much or as little as the local department asks. Now, by the way, with respect to photograph seven behind you, do you see the uh, fingerprint that you were mentioning on this? If you can stand up, please, and go towards the screen. Um, here I can. You can see it here. This. Uh, not a very clear picture, but that's that's the area. Okay. So this this smudged area in the center. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> and just to clarify, this is picture eight and picture nine. Uh, can you see that photograph or the fingerprint on the photograph? Yes. Okay. Uh, if you could just point it out for the record. So with the application of the side light, uh, see the flash here? So it'll really bring up the, uh, the ridge detail on the fingerprint. And do you point it to the middle of the screen? Um, yes, sir. Okay. Now you said a side light? Uh, the side light is right here. Do you utilize that in photographing fingerprints? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, thank you. You can have a seat, sir. Now, did you enter the kitchen at all? Yes, I did. And how do you get to the kitchen from the from the garage? So from the garage, you will go through that uh, that mudroom door that I removed the uh, the doorknob from. You will enter a small uh, mudroom uh, that had some like cubbies and, and coat hooks and and then you will enter a uh, kitchen. Is that the mudroom that you were mentioning? Yes. So um, you see on the, uh, the left-hand side of the photograph, uh, that's the mudroom door. And what is that? This is states, uh, I guess, picture two. 
Is yes, that that's... also the mudroom? Uh, correct. Now, the door at the end of that in the picture, I guess that's in the middle of the picture. Uh, where does that lead to? Uh, I believe that leads to the backyard. Is that a door that you had swabbed uh, for the handles that you were talking about earlier? Yes. And picture three? Picture three is a, a photo of the kitchen. Uh, you'll see the oh, you see the center island and in that in that far corner. That's the doorway into the mudroom. And picture four. Uh, again, a photograph of the uh, of the kitchen. Uh, the mudroom doorway is to the right, uh, right adjacent to that purse on the floor. Uh, speaking about the purse on the floor in the bottom right, did you take any action with respect to that purse? Uh, yes, we did. Um, th uh, somewhere during processing, we uh, we examined the purse. For any items of uh, evidentiary value, we laid everything out on the dining room table that was in it, photographed it, documented it, and I, I believe we seized it, uh, not on the warrant, but if, for safekeeping, and turned that over to uh, New Canaan. Uh, did, did you, um, with respect to picture five, is this what you were talking about? Does it depict the contents of the purse? Yes. Did you do that? Uh, I assisted with that, yes. Okay. And picture six? Um, again, just another view of the purse contents. Okay. Now, with respect to picture seven, uh, do you see the, on the bottom right, there is a number 13. Do you, um, do you see where I'm speaking, sir? About? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, what is that? That is a uh, paper towel roll uh, that we, we examined and we found uh, what appeared to be uh, blood stains on it. Okay. Now, did you put the 13 down? I did. Okay. What it, for purposes, what is that called? Uh, we, we call them evidence placards. Uh, different departments call them different things. But again, it's a, just a number to designate the state police exhibit number that we're going to document under. And item 13 is that... Uh, the paper towel rolls right next to it? Uh, yes. Is this it, how the paper towel rolls were found? That's off how the holder or on the holder? Uh, it was uh, off the holder. Okay. And I'm actually going to show you states nine. Actually, I'll go back. I'm sorry. States uh, picture eight. Um, upon looking at that, I guess the item 13, the paper towel holder, or paper, I'm sorry, paper towels. Uh, you indicated there was a uh, blood like stain. Is that what you said? Yes. Where was that? It was uh, on the upper part and on the inside cardboard tube of the paper towel roll. Who found that? Uh, I did. States uh, photograph nine. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Can you explain what that shows, sir? So this is the uh, the area of uh, the apparent blood that we found on the paper towel roll. And what did you do once you observed it? Uh, I field tested it. Um, what does that mean? So I uh, we have a presumptive field test that we utilize uh, in the major crime squad. Uh, it, it screens for the, the presence I'm of blood. I'm going to object to this testimony. This witness is not qualified to testify to this. Well, no. the, the issue of the presumptive test is going to require essentially argument outside of the presence of the jury. It is 425. What the court is inclined to do dismiss the jury for today. We can take up the argument on the if I can, Your Honor. 
So yes, Runner, I would just indicate I am not done with my foundation questions with him. I don't know if that it will influence the court's decisions with respect to any ruling. Well, um, the testimony was about the fee. This is a test that we conduct in order to. And Attorney Schoenhorn stood up and rightly indicated this is the subject of a matter that should be taken up outside of the presence of the jury. The foundational question was leading, not inappropriately, leading this witness to talk about what that test is and what it's supposed to show. That's fine. So the testimony that he administered a test stands. But that's as far as it goes. Yes, Your Honor. So what the court is going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is dismiss you for today. Of course, the holiday is on Monday. We do not know what the weather report will be for Tuesday. But as of right now, uh, we would ask that you report, well, in fact, check the judicial branch website for information about whether or not juries are going to be brought in on Tuesday. That information will be on the judicial branch website. If we are in session, we will resume on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. We ask that you, again, not discuss the case, not follow any media reports about the case. Thank you and have a Big weekend. Fears to the court, you may be seated. The fears to the court that the easiest way for the court to determine the admissibility of the evidence is to hear the offer of proof through this witness. May I question him, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Sergeant Riley, with respect to a, uh, you said a field test, uh, what do you mean by field test? So it's a, it's a screening test. Uh, we use for the presence of blood. Uh, it's called the uh, Kasselmeyer test. It consists of uh, two reagents, a phenolphthalein and then a hydrogen peroxide. When you combine these two chemicals together, nine times out of 10 on a swab and wait a couple of minutes, it's going to change to a bright pink color. That's part of the, the uh, chemical reaction. If uh, we combine those two chemicals onto a swab and we get an immediate color change. That's a positive indication for the presence of blood. So the way we conduct the test is we have a suspected stain that we think may be blood. We'll collect a small amount of that stain on a swab, put a drop of the phenolphthalein solution on it, uh, wait a couple of seconds to see if there's any color change. If there's not, we'll put a drop of hydrogen peroxide on that swab. And if we get an immediate color, immediate bright pink color change, that's a positive, uh, positive indication. And how many times have you conducted this uh, presumptive test? Thousands. And are you trained in it? Yes. How, can you please explain some of your training? Uh, my training is, is uh, basically through the, the State Police Forensic Lab where uh, we obtain uh, the special formulation of phenolphthalein solution. Um, they provide us that reagent, uh, and then we uh, obtain the hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide and uh, sterile water that we use as a solvent to actually collect the stain from a chemical supply house. Uh, so the training was through uh, forensic lab and in-service program. And when were you trained to do this? Uh, 
sometime in the early 2000s. And is there any changes in the way that um, the uh, testing has been done since the early 2000s? No. Okay, and is there any, um, do you continuously get that, uh, the items and the, um, I guess the reagent, is that the, what is that issue or what causes the change? Um, a, a reagent is just a, a fancy name for a chemical. Okay, do you get that directly from the Connecticut State Lab? Yes, I do. Now, with res what exactly is, if you can just explain what the results of that mean, the test? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I left a step out. So uh, if we get that immediate color change, uh, it means that the chemical reaction has been sped up. So it means there's a catalyst present on that swab where we combine the chemicals. Uh, that catalyst that we're, we're looking for is the hemoglo hemoglobin component of blood. And does that um, state whether or not, or tell you whether or not it is blood or what type of blood or anything uh, in relation to that? It's, it's uh, a positive screen for uh, blood. So it uh, leads us to believe it is blood. However, it won't screen uh, human from any other blood that contains hemoglobin, uh, excuse me, hemoglobin. So it'll, uh, it won't di differentiate between animal blood and human blood. Does it test a positive or change color in relation to anything besides that hemoglobin? Yes, I mean, basically anything with uh, a perioxidase uh, uh, ability to it. So uh, certain foods, uh, horseradish, turmeric come to mind. Uh, you know, there's, there could be some other, um, other items that, that would cause a false positive. Um, However, we just use it as a screening test. If we, uh, uh, you know, if it's a suspect stain, a substance we don't know, we'll still collect it. Now, with respect to the item 13 behind you, uh, just walk me through the steps that you conducted with that. Um, so, I would take a, uh, a swab moistened with uh, sterile water uh, collect a small amount of that uh, reddish brown substance onto the swab. It's a very uh, sensitive test. Again, drop, um, put a drop of the phenothalin solution on it. Wait a second or two. Put another drop of the hydrogen yeah, peroxide on. He's talking in present. Well, this is this is this is an offer of proof. Right, but I I'm, I don't even know if he's talking about what he did here, which was the I question. I believe my question was, what did you do? Yeah. <coughs> Open you. And oh, uh, after waiting a few seconds, I would, uh, I mean, I did put a uh, drop of the hydrogen peroxide solution on it, obtaining an immediate, uh, immediate result, positive result, that bright pink color. Uh, I noted it as such. Um, then later, uh, I packaged uh, the, uh, the roll of paper towel and noted the positive field test on the evidence label. Uh, that is the state's offer of proof with respect to the field test, Your Honor. I, I'm also assuming it would be with respect to, to can I just ask a, one follow-up question? With respect to other items that were field tested, is it, did you keep the that day on May 27th or 25th, uh, 2019, is it the same process that you just testified to? Yes. Okay. Nothing changes based on the substance or the item that you're testing? No. Okay. Oh, the court has a few concerns. First is the phrase positive indication. Now, as the court understands the explanation, there can be a positive indication for other than hemoglobin. So the term positive indication by itself. The court is understanding the testimony to mean positive indication for blood. So just to say positive indication would be misleading. As the court understood the testimony, even radishes 
can render a positive indication. Secondly, the court is concerned about the phrase false positive. To be clear, the court understands that phrase to mean false positive for hemoglobin. Otherwise, if there is the hydrogen peroxide applied and immediate, it immediately turns colored, that's not a false positive, that's just positive. Third concern the court has, and the court may have to think about this over a period of time. The third concern the court has is this. The training undergone by the state police trains for blood only. The court does not understand the training to include all of the substances that could render a positive result. So if there are 40 substances that render a positive result, the court's understanding is that the training doesn't include watching the change in color concerning 40 substances. The training is very limited, as the court understands, to hemoglobin. As the court understands the testimony, this test can not differentiate between animal or human hemoglobin and will render a positive result for other than hemoglobin. So the court is going to take its time, not render a decision today, but when we return, the court has to think this through. On certain matters, the court plays slow pitch. There's nothing else concerning the offer today, correct? Your Honor, I can clear up some of those with the directions and the concern the court has on direct and the nature of the state's questions. I would just indicate that. But with respect to the offer, beyond addressing Your Honor's concerns, no. So it is unlikely that we will forget where we left off when we reconvene on Tuesday. Judge, can I speak around a brief scheduling issue? Yes. Maybe throw a 6 to 12 foot pitch. The defense, Your Honor, as you recall yesterday, filed a motion to exclude certain DNA science, and they specifically requested a quarter hearing. Now, we did anticipate getting to some DNA evidence, not all of it, next week. And so my concern, Your Honor, is if the court is inclined to grant a quarter hearing, which of course we don't think we should, we wrote extensively about that in our memorandum, that that could potentially eat up an entire day of evidence. And so I just want to get this motion on the books so that maybe we can get back to some fast pitch. That's all. Well, what the court cannot contemplate at this time, turning again into the double header. So we'll leave that for next week. And I'll just schedule. I just looked at my weather app for one of the Connecticut television stations, but I will not specify which one. It says watching a major winter storm for Tuesday. So what should we do and how should we find out before Tuesday whether we're going to proceed or not? Is there a way I can find out from Your Honor by email so that we're... Well, what happens with the court is that over the judicial branch alert system, the judges do not have to consult the website. We would get an emergency alert. But the court thinks that that alert would have gone out to others who would alert jurors not to come in. So for other than court staff, it probably would be the website. And if I could just inquire 
other than this discrete issue, I assume the witness is excused for today. Other than this discrete issue, how much longer um, we'd like to at least plan for Tuesday, assuming we're going forward, um, how much longer we have a direct with this witness. I'm not going to have a lot of cross. And then at least we can, I can, we can find out who other witnesses are going to be on Tuesday. Your Honor, uh, we spent a good hour and a half authenticating the video, videos. So maybe not an hour and a half, but a good hour. But not the videos, the pictures. Uh, I am only beginning my uh, direct at this point to go through all the photographs. Uh, I assume that Detective Riley should be done by one, maybe. Uh, on, I'm going to be uh, positive and say he, uh, we were hoping to. I know uh, Detective Riley also has a, is under subpoena in federal court for Tuesday. So uh, we will try and, but I can't predict how long the direct is going to be. I'm not going to argue a supremacy clause issue. As far as I'm concerned, this court is more important than whatever is going oh, on. Oh, I completely court. agree with counsel on that one. <laughs> I just wanted to inform the court that I do know Detective Riley is uh, very much wanted in multiple courts. Well, let's just see how things develop for Tuesday. Thank you. If, uh, detective, you can, I'm sorry, Sergeant, you can. Thank you, Your Honor. So the jury has been excused. They've been told to pay attention to the judicial website to see if they will stand adjourned today. All rise. This honorable state for now stands adjourned until Tuesday, January 16th. <laughs>